Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I have a picture of the kids really doing everything up out there when they're all really little. Oh, yeah. Carl said, are you
I know. <laughs> Several times. Can you? Maybe we're muted over there. Like at the headquarters. <laughs> no, we just we don't control any of that. Otherwise, we'd be like, oh, yeah, like, oh, right. Uh, fine. Good idea. Can't rule them out. It's already the forest. I know. Me too. I don't know. Um, is the meeting in session for like all the different things? Oh, yeah, the meeting's on. Yeah, should got the agenda posted. Anybody else know anything about your phones? Really? Here's a new one. We all did today. What have you done? Yes. Testing. So that's always live. Those guys, but I don't know who does that. It's a little bit more right deck. That's Ryan Houston. Were you able to let anybody else come on? No. Skip Tanner is still here. Can you turn it off and back on again? <laughs> I don't even know what that means. The cure all. And it's going to hurt the bottom to try to find some. We know who it is. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they hit that old nice and good. Can't get all reboot. She's just popping all the plugs out. <laughs> it was. Yellow. Wow, they're all the colors. You don't touch it. <laughs> don't touch it. I've been setting all of them. Give it a second, though. Sure. <laughs> Maybe that's how they came up with it. Yeah. Let's wait until it's done flashing for everybody and wait till this screen populates. Do you have to, did you have to do anything for that? It didn't say sure, so I assume it's still booting. Waiting for registration. This isn't live, right? You can kill them. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay, good. Okay. Uh, now it's 6.08 and I'll call to uh, order the uh, City of Glenwood Springs Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, regular meeting of May 23rd, 2023. And um, this is a hybrid meeting with uh, in-person and Zoom. Uh, passcode of, for Zoom is 177366, and telephone number is 1-719-359-4580. And Louisa, please call the roll. Commissioner Sipperly? Nah. Commissioner Sims? Present. Commissioner Waller, Commissioner Connerton, Commissioner Shaver. Here. Commissioner White, Commissioner Davey. Present. Commissioner Houghton. Present. Commissioner Cowan. Great, okay. And I'd like to um, welcome April and and Matthew to the commission as new members. And um, I'll, I'll entertain a motion to seat alternate Cowan um, and uh, alternate Halton. I move to seat them, and I don't believe George has to change your red light to green. And speak. I would love to do that. <laughs> we have to turn yours off. That's a fun one. <laughs> um, I have Ryan coming down in a second to try and resolve this because it's set up, George, so that everyone can request to speak. And when you request to speak, your mic is red, and then the chair approves you to speak and then it should turn green. I, I, and I do that by touching the screen under their, mm -hmm. beside their name or on their name. I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, that's not working. <clears throat> I hit the button and I got a number. Would you like to like take a quick break and then he gets down here or it sounds yep. like a good Would plan. you like to announce that you're just going to take a quick break so that there is a Okay, we're going to take a short technical break here and hopefully get all this resolved. Oh, <laughs> yes, we're back again, and um, 
just seat the alternates, Gregor Cowan and John Houghton. Well, there's a lot of stuff to do here. I move to seat the alternates. We need to second, second. Okay, good. We've got a, a motion and a second, and uh, we'll do a voice vote. All, the, all in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? Welcome. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Um, the We have no quorum for uh, members that were at the last meeting, to, so we won't be able to receive those meet, minutes. So I'll entertain a motion to continue um, receipt of those minutes to our next regular scheduled meeting. Motion to continue those. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to continue the meeting minutes and I will do another voice vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, moving along. Um, I'll now open um, the floor to citizens appearing that are um, for items that are not on the agenda. So I don't believe we have anybody present. And I don't see any attendees on Zoom. So I will re uh, close that portion of the meeting and bring it back to the council or commission. And we have a new item, um, planning file 0123, sign variances for Walmart. And Watkins is here to fill us in. Good evening, everybody. Give me a second to queue up the presentation. All right, can you guys all see this? Yes. Looks like it. Okay, um, good to see you all tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, we're here to talk about some of the intricacies of land use regulations tonight. We're gonna talk a lot about signs. I see some new faces here. Um, it's great to see you guys. Please ask lots of questions. The way this is gonna work tonight is I'm gonna do a brief presentation, turn it over to our applicants who are here. Um, and then you all be, will be, have a chance to ask both us and them questions, and I'm, I'm sure you, you may have some. So uh, the first item we're going to talk about is uh, Walmart. They're requesting five variances from the land use code, um, and I'm going to read them off to you real quick. Um, a variance to exceed the limit of two attached signs in a multi-tenant building to allow a sign on a wall that is not a building frontage to exceed the total maximum uh, sign area to exceed the maximum height limitation for a pole sign and to utilize a pole sign without two supporting poles. Uh, for everyone who doesn't know, Walmart is located at 3010 Blake, um, can be accessed uh, via 27th Street or 29th Street um, or from Blake itself. So I wanted to do, go kind of to basics first. When we talk about signs, um, there are obviously a lot of different kinds of signs. This is gonna seem a little bit obvious. Um, we, we have wall signs, which are attached to walls or to the sides of buildings generally. Uh, we have projecting signs. Sometimes those are called blade signs, which project from the building. Roof signs are kind of like wall signs, except they extend over the top of the of a wall. Uh, and then we have freestanding signs. There are kind of some different technical terms for um, alternative terms for all these kinds of signs. There are other kinds of signs too. Uh, this is probably a good time to say that I am not an expert on signs by any means. Um, I know hopefully enough to be dangerous and enough to apply our regulations. Um, if you ask questions that I don't know about, I will just say that I'm not a sign installer. Uh, so the existing conditions at Walmart right now, we have seven wall signs uh, and one pole sign. There are four existing nonconformities on the site. Nonconformities meaning things that aren't in compliance with our code right now. Um, that's not necessarily an unusual condition throughout the city. 
uh, the nonconformities are two with the pole sign. One is the, the height of the pole sign. It exceeds our height limit for pole signs. The other is the fact that the pole sign is on two supporting piers as opposed to just one the way the code requires. Um, it does exceed the number of signs that's allowed. And the sign that's on the west elevation of the building um, is on, um, that, that elevation is not considered building frontage uh, because it doesn't have windows or a public, a, a public entrance. Um, and so it's technically not allowed to have signage on that elevation. Here's some pictures. We can refer back to it any time if you guys would like. And so going into what the um, applicants are requesting, we're looking here at the, uh, this would be the south elevation. And so on the right side, um, we're seeing here that it says outdoor, that outdoor sign. Remember, this is what's proposed. That outdoor sign would propose, would replace what is uh, currently lawn and garden. Um, the Walmart sign itself would be replaced. The home and pharmacy sign would be replaced. We would add the pickup sign. Uh, and then the grocery sign that's on there right now is proposed to remain unchanged. And again, feel free to, we can scroll back to what's existing if you guys would like to. Uh, here we have the north elevation. Um, this is proposed again. So the Walmart sign is there currently, but it would be replaced. There's a pickup sign there currently, and that would be replaced. This is the west elevation. Uh, they're requesting to replace the Walmart sign. Haven't gotten any comments from either the public or any of our reviewing agencies. And so this here is a chart uh, showing the seven variance criteria. To be approved for variance, all seven of these criteria have to be met. Um, in your eyes, the Planning and Zoning Commission, you'll have to make findings um, that each request, each of the five requests, uh, meets these conditions. Um, I'm going to now move through each of these conditions, um, briefly explain uh, the staff analysis, um, same thing that's, that's in your packet. Uh, and if you guys would like, we could come back to this because this is kind of a, an orderly way to show all of them together. So I will read you a fair amount of text here. Uh, the first condition is that, or criteria that needs to be met is that the subject property has an exceptional shape, topography, building configuration, or other exceptional site conditions that is not a general condition throughout the zone district. Um, staff believes that there's maybe somewhat unusual topography there, you know, some um, it's kind of standing on top of a hill, uh, but, and it falls away as it goes down to the Highway 82. It's not terribly unusual, perhaps, in Glenwood Springs. However, we do think it is unusual to have two entrances. Um, there, there probably are some other examples out there, but we, we think it is not common. So staff analysis is, is that it does meet this criteria. Number two, the strict application of the code standards for which a variance is sought would produce undue hardship. Um, and staff does, does not believe that the uh, requests meet this. We believe that there are code compliant alternatives out there. Uh, three, the applicant did not create the hardship by his or her own actions. Um, we, we do believe that they created these through their requests and that there are code compliant alternatives. Four, the variance requested does not harm the public and does not impair the intent or purpose of the code goals, policies, including a specific regulation for which the variance is sought. Um, we don't think it meets this. We think it could add to uh, visual clutter, excesses, excessive signage, um, and a kind of looming pole sign. Number five, the variance request demonstrates exceptional hardship not related to purposes of convenience or financial burden. Again, we think there are other options out there and that, we don't, that it does not meet this criterion. Uh, number six, the variance request will not violate building or fire code requirements. We do think it meets that. Number seven, the variance is the minimum variance that will afford relief from the uh, subject standards of the code. And again, we think there are, are alternatives out there, so we do not think it meets that one. So again, there are five specific uh, variances that are requested today. That means there are five action items. Um, and so number one is about the total number of signs. Number two is about the uh, sign that is not on building frontage. Three is the maximum total sign area, which I should mention uh, refers really to just the south elevation. Uh, the north elevation does it does fit within that maximum signage area. Uh, the north, ele excuse me, south elevation does not. Number action item four is uh, about the height limitation of the pole sign. Five is that the existing pole sign has two supporting poles instead of one. 
So alternatives that are available to the applicant, we think, are the maintenance and upkeep of existing signs, those that are there right now, perfectly acceptable to, to maintain them, keep them in good order, um, could reduce the area of the proposed signage on the south elevation. They could reduce the number of signs that, they, that they're requesting, uh, and they could replace the pole sign with a code compliant pole sign that would remove two of the, the variances. Um, so if you all uh, want to approve any of these five variances, um, again, I can show this the screen for you to, to refer to if you'd like, um, but you would need to make a, a motion finding that all seven of these variance criteria, uh, that it meets all seven of these variance criteria for whichever of the five variances they're requesting. Yep, I think that's all I've got for you guys. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over now to Walmart. Um, Watkins, I, um, can, usually we ask questions of, of staff before we sure. move on. So um, I'd like to bring it up here and, and uh, see if we have any questions for you, which yeah. looks like we do from Carolyn. Oh, darn, I hit the button. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation, Watkins. I see under the request part of our packet, it is referring to signs in a multi-tenant building, but farther down, um, in the action items, it does refer to it as a single tenant building. So I just want to confirm that there is only one tenant in the Walmart building. Carolyn with the eagle eyes. <laughs> it yeah. is a single tenant building. Thank you. Okay. So otherwise, it would have been permitted more signs. Uh, fewer signs, actually. Uh, multi, multi tenant buildings could only have one sign per, per tenant. Okay. Thank you. Um. Watkins, I, I'll go back to what the alternatives are that, that, that you see and, and expand upon that, if you would, a little bit. Yes. I'm not actually sure why the presentation went away. Here it is again. Um, the co combined alternatives you're asking for? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think I need to share it. Excuse me. Oh, no, that's the wrong presentation. Not there yet. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. Here you are. Sorry about that delay. Yeah, could you, could you expand upon that a little bit? Um, in other words, um, one one of the things that I think the applicant was looking for is uh, more visibility from Highway 82. Um, is there an opportunity for them to have, say, a monument sign on 82 or on some property down there that would show people that there is a Walmart there? That is technically a possibility. Um, it's not something they've, they've requested. What, how we would consider that would be an off-premise sign because it would not be on Walmart's property. Um, and so we we do have a process for that. Um, it would come before you all. And so they could request that. Okay. All right. There's something I thought of that uh, might, you know, in today's world, when you have Google Maps, I mean, finding stuff is pretty easy. Although maybe not as easy for me after my technical difficulties here. But um, But if you don't know that there's a Walmart, you know, having a sign that would direct you there would be uh, beneficial to the to the company, I would assume. So anyway, that's that's what prompted that thought. Um, do we have any other questions for Watkins at this moment? No. Well, then I'd uh, encourage the applicant to come forward and and make their presentation. And uh, please state your name. Sure. Hello, my name is Kevin Spurgeon. I'm from LK Architecture in Wichita, Kansas. This is Katie Simpson. She's um, also from LK Architecture and we're representing Walmart. Um, we are the architect of record for this store. Watkins, can I run this or let me just go back to elevation. Sure. Um, 
I just want to show the front elevation just so I have a talking point. Okay, maybe we could just go back to you. Uh, and so proposed the, or the existing? The, um, proposed. Sure. So I, I hear Watkins had said a, a few times that these some of these signs were non-conforming. At, at some point, these signs were conforming. So, and then he said that the um, that that Walmart had um, produced a hardship. It it truly wasn't Walmart that produced a hardship if if the code changed. So then we fell out of conformance. So we're just, we are trying to get back into conformance, but we're also trying to be uh, consistent with Walmart's brand across the country. I, I don't think anything on here is 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 out of the realm of possibilities. I know there was um, Watkins had spoken about the two pole monument sign. Um, and I, I'd spoken to Walmart about this and, and we're willing just to, to take the, take the pylon sign out of, um, off the, off the table and just leave it as existing, um, which to my knowledge, that's, that's okay that we can do that as, as long as it's, it's an externally lit sign, we can just leave it as is. And so I would, so just, so that takes care of two variants. So it's, let's just, I'd rather not, uh, introduce a new internally lit sign on the pylon sign. So I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, Walmart's good with that. Uh, as far as the what we what we really need, um, we had a pickup sign on the building, and when Katie and I came and visited the site and scope trips and whatnot, we noticed that the, one of the pickup signs was actually removed from the building and never put back on. So we're we're just asking for the pickup signs to be on the building so we can direct um, the customers to the pickup location. Um, if, if those signs aren't on the building, then there's a lot of driving around. It's like, where do we go to pick up our groceries? You know, I've seen this throughout other stores. Even when we do have the pickup sign, there's confusion. So I, I just want to keep the directional, what I consider directional signage um, on the on the building um, so, for, so the customers can find the location for the pickup. Uh, Walmart is also willing to um, and in doing so, if, if we can have those those two pickup signs, and again, this is unusual that we have two 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 frontages on this store. If we'll, we're willing to take off the outdoor sign as well, just not have that on there, um, and so that that lowers our square footage, um, reduces the amount of of signage. So Walmart's willing to give a little, but I would love. Obviously, we need the Walmart brand sign on there, like the two pickup signs. Um, home and pharmacy and grocery are pretty consistent across the country. Um, I, I've been to jurisdictions where you know um, I talk with them, and uh, sometimes the requirements are just I'm not saying that these are silly, but some of these are so silly where we only have 20 square feet on a huge big big box store for one sign, and. In, in talking through this, in you know, we're allowed greater signage or greater uh, greater signs. But I think with this, we're, we're not asking too much. We're just uh, this is again, we're just trying to be consistent across the country with Walmart's um, rollout of their new brand that's been going on for about two to two to three years now. Um, that's about all I have to say. If you guys have any questions regarding the new signage, all right, thank you and. Uh... Bringing it back up here to, to and, the and commission. Yeah, um, actually, I'd like to make another point on the, the the Walmart sign that's on the side of the building. This it is unusual topo for for this. So having that Walmart sign on the side of the building um, really helps for the customer to see this building. And I know, and I've, I've heard this before, where it's like everybody knows where Walmart is. Everybody knows where things are inside of Walmart. It's like, that's true if you're a repeat customer and you're an older customer, been going there for years, but Walmart not only tries to, to have the repeat customers, but they're also bringing in new customers. They're bringing in young, younger customers and we just want, we want them to have a good experience uh, going to a Walmart. And I don't know if you've been into a new Walmart yet with um, Katie and I went through this one with the new signage, um, with the remodeled bathrooms. Uh, new flooring. We also got new apparels. Um, it, it looks great. So we just we we want to uh, to to continue that, you know, as well as on the outside of the building. Okay, I'm done.
Okay, thank you. Um, any questions for the applicant? Okay. Oh. Which signs were you willing to drop off again? The the outdoor sign. We're willing just to to let that one go. Get rid of that one. And then the the pylon sign was part of this request. Um, and if if we don't request an internally lit pylon sign, then um, it is my understanding that we just get to keep the two the two pole pylon sign that's externally lit. So I just just move that off, just move that out of the request. So that takes care of three variances. So a reduction. Thank you. So Watkins, um, can you speak to that about um, the, the the pole sign? I understand, um, but I'm wondering about if the reduction of that one um, outdoor sign does does that change anything in terms of um, the code and and meeting code? Does it meet code at that point? So he he's correct. The the, the pole sign can remain uh, if they don't want to make any changes to it. That that's all good. Um, if the outdoor sign is removed, uh, Walmart would still have be proposing more signs than are allowed because remember only two signs are allowed, um, and so they would still have uh, six total, and so that would still that would still require variance to 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 replace these others. Um, we'd have to do the math. I believe the the outdoor sign is maybe twenty one square feet. Sure. Um, that would get you close, but maybe not quite to. Right. That would, that would be one of the other variances is about exceeding the um, total sign area that's allowed on that south elevation. So that would be close and maybe not quite. Um, I don't know if you all would be willing to modify some of the other signs to get under that, uh, the, the limitation on sign area. I mean, we're, we're trying, it's just like I said, these were conforming. Yes, yeah. like the, yep. I mean, we're trying to go back uh, with Walmart. Um, and again, it's a, it's a two-sided, uh, frontal elevation. So, and and again, these were conforming at one time. So we're, um, I can't strip too much off the building and I can't speak for what I can speak for Walmart is what I've already said. I can't speak in any more about removing things. Um, we're, that's, that's what we have on the table right now, as far as um, removal of that criteria and reducing our uh, variance request. All right. Carolyn. I have a question, Watkins. Um, the pickup sign has been indicated by the applicant that it's a directional sign. And I recall in code that directional signs are treated differently than branding type of signs. Um, this sign is directing someone where to go do something. Do we have a different code section that would apply to those pickup signs? We do have, we do um, um, allow uh, directional signs to uh, be installed without sign permits, but this is not a, a directional sign as our as our code contemplates. The directional signs are limited to, I believe, 42 inches high, so that's kind of a different sign than um, at least as the way our code considers it. Agreed. Thanks. And, and we do consider this a directional sign just because we have the arrow, and the arrow is a big deal directing people to the the, the side of the building. Uh, as well as on the other side, the arrow directing people to go that direction. If the uh, if the, the dispensing doors for a pickup were on the front of the building, then it would just it would also say pickup. Um, so we 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 do in Walmart's eyes and and uh, LK Architecture's eyes, we do consider this directional signage. You know uh, the history of why that pickup sign was taken off. Before? We do not. We do not. Um, it's. I, I could take a guess since I've been working in architecture for 30 years that there was uh, a sign company came in and was going to replace the sign and uh, Walmart store managers. Uh, there's there's a there's a turnaround on that and then that just didn't get you know it all comes down to communication and then that didn't get communicated back to Walmart that that sign needs to come go back up. Okay, thank you. Um, let's seeing no more questions up here. I'll uh, open up the uh, floor to comments from the public on this item.
And seeing none, I'll close the public uh, portion of, um, regarding this and bring it up to the commission for um, what we've got quite a number of motions to make here. We have, uh, what is it, five action items? Two being taken off the table. Yeah, well, I, I'm still going to have I, to address those. I think you could um, reflect in the record that the applications for those two variances um, have been withdrawn. Okay, those would be four. Yeah, I was just about to clarify which numbers those are. Uh, four and five. Okay, is that what it is. Okay, when we get to four and five, we'll. Yes, four and that. five are the pull signs, and um, the, they've indicated that they're willing to remove one of the signs, one of the wall signs, um, which, doing some math in my head real quick, would put them, I believe, commit, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but close, but still exceeding the, uh, the limit of, of signage area on, on that frontage. Um, and, and please correct me if I'm misspeaking, but I think you could potentially condition, um, if, if you wish to, you could condition um, action item one, which is about the number of signs, um, so that they don't exceed, let me see how am I saying this right. Um, it's, possible, it's possible to not exceed the area of the wall signs. They might have to make some more tweaks. Um, but so you, you could take four and five off the table. Um, and if the applicant's willing to modify the other signage so as to not exceed the area, that would take away number action item number three. Well, if I'm not correct as it's presented to us, three is still exceeding the allowable area. Is that not correct? As, as proposed, yep, by about five square feet. And so that's relatively easy to make up, I think. So, so it, I, if, they, if they made that change, they wouldn't need a variance. Is so that they, correct? They wouldn't need a variance if they didn't exceed the maximum total of sign, a maximum sign area. So eliminating the outdoor sign like they've discussed, that eliminates 21 square feet. That gives them five square feet away from, from the limit. We can do the we can do the five square feet and get rid of that too. We can reduce one of the signs, if not two signs. And I'm thinking that the pickup signs we can reduce those in size and that would give us the, the five square feet that I know we can do. So Richard, help me out here. <laughs> um, so I think I see two options. One is the applicant would withdraw action item three in addition to four and five, or, and then you make that a condition of action item one. Is that correct, Watkins? Yes. Or you deny action item three, and you could still make a condition of action item one to go below that. To comply with the maximum total sign area, I it sounds like the applicant is willing to withdraw action item three. Yes, and that would be a condition of action item one that it would be below the maximum area sign. Mm -hmm. And so with their sign permits, they, they submit sign permits for these things, they would be reflect that the sign area would be reflected in those. And it would, as we're discussing it now, that would be under the limit and therefore not need a variance for, for that aspect of it. So I guess I'm not clear about, uh, are you clear on what motion you're gonna make? <laughs> I think so, but I have to figure out criteria in order to not do what it says here in our staff report. So I'm going to probably need that up on the screen yeah. again. So there's a lot of need to make a motion. Um, <laughs> 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 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll pull these up for you. Uh, okay. You were wanting this, Carolyn, or did you want the analysis going through each one? Uh, the one where if we were to approve as opposed to deny, how I have to say. The, the alternative. You had the fill in the blanks one. Yeah, yeah, that one. Thank you. Okay, so regarding planning file 0123, sign variances for Walmart. Um, action item number one, the variance requests to allow the applicant to exceed limit of two total wall projecting a roof signs with up to one per building frontage at a single tenant building. I move to approve said variance request with the condition that the area and square footage of signs on the facades of the building does not exceed that which would be approved by our sign code. <laughs> because the subject property does have an exceptional topography, the strict application of the code standards would produce hardship because the basically the parking lot is huge and it is important for customers to use um, wayfinding signage on the building. The applicant uh, did not uh, create the hardship because the signs had previously been allowed. Uh, it is unfortunate that the one pickup sign went missing. The variance does not harm the public and does not impair the intent or purposes of the code. The variance does demonstrate hardship not related to convenience or financial burden because the store is actually representing several different departments and functions uh, all under the umbrella of one business. The variance will not violate building or fire code requirements and it is the minimum that will afford relief of the subject standards. Matthew, I'll second that motion. <laughs> okay, great. We have a motion to um, approve the variance from uh, Commissioner Cipriani and a second from Commissioner Sims. And um, any other comments from the commission? Then I'll call the question. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, uh, action item two. To allow wall sign is not considered building frontage. Let me know if you need me to pull up the slide again. I'm seeing nods. Carolyn, please. Regarding action item two of the same application request, I move to deny the wall sign that is not uh, considered on building frontage. Um, that's my motion. With the oh, uh, on. findings and conditions on pages eight through 10. Okay, we have a motion. I'll second that, that, that motion. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Sipperly and a second by Commissioner Sims uh, to deny. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. The motion is to deny. Motion passed unanimously. Okay, and let the record show that the applicant has uh, withdrawn variance requests under action item three, four, and five. So we will not need to address that any further. So thank you all. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, and uh,
So moving on to uh, new items B, planning file 20-23 variants to Glenwood Meadows master sign plan. Sign plan. And uh, Watkins is the man of the hour again. He is pulling up the slideshow and sharing it. Okay, we're now gonna dive further into the minutia of land use regulation and signs. This, is, this application is for uh, a variance to change a provision of the Glenwood Meadows master sign plan regarding internally illuminated channel cut letters. The Glenwood Meadows master sign plan um, is specific to the Glenwood Meadows area. Um, Glenwood Meadows, as you all know, and I'll show you um, a, a map of where it is, that is uh, kind of West Glenwood, south of the, the railroad track, south of bound by Midland Avenue. Um, and everything that we kind of talked about in that last item, we talked about you know, the number of wall signs that are allowed, the areas that are allowed, things like that. You can forget most of that for this item because the, the Glenwood Meadows Master Sign Plan, which I'm gonna refer to tonight just as the Master Sign Plan, um, this is what governs signage in the Glenwood Meadows area. This is a document that was um, passed by a, a few different actions in 2003 and 2004, I believe. Um, and so we can talk about some of the details of it, but it's really just one particular detail that we're, that is at issue tonight. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the all, all signs in Glenwood Meadows development must comply with the master sign plan. Um, this is the general area where it is. And just to recap, um, some of the same terminology applies, wall signs uh, in, the, in the master sign plan, they're actually referred to fascia signs. That's a detail that doesn't matter. Uh, we have projecting signs out there. Um, there may be a one or two roof signs, uh, not too many out there. And then also not very many freestanding signs. But there is some specific terminology that I'm going to use tonight and that the master sign plan uses. Pan channel letters. It's not something you cook in a skillet. Uh, we're talking about signs that have letters that are individually cut. So each sign has letters um, that are kind of separate from the rest of it. These letters are attached to a wall or to a, a panel um, that protrude a little bit from the wall. Internally illuminated is self-explanatory. They have a light source that's usually LED that's inside them. Letter returns, uh, that, that ter term does not really make sense like internally illuminated does. Letter returns refers to the sides of the letters, you could say. Remember that they're, they're individually cut and they protrude from the wall. So they have kind of, you could call them side walls that make a little bit more sense. We're talking about that. And as you'll see, we're talking about the color of those. The applicant is requesting tonight to remove this bullet that I'll read to you from sheet 3.1 of the master sign plan. The letter returns shall be painted to match a building standard color that generally matches the building's primary masonry color. So this is prescriptive about what color that letter return has to be. Um, and then the highlighted text on the right, I don't necessarily expect you to, be able to read this, that says what I just read to you. This is sheet 3.1 from the master sign plan. And so why are we processing this as a variance? The annexation and development agreements uh, prescribes the process for changing it. It says that it shall use the city's variance process. And so that's, that's why we're doing a variance tonight. This is not for any specific tenant. Um, there was one tenant that kind of brought this to a head, um, but by approving this, you're approving any future sign permits um, that, that comply with this. So this is not about any specific tenant or specific sign. And I'm just gonna show you some photos. This may be a little bit hard to see, but you can, kind of see what the, the letter returns look like. Um, the one on the top right for zoomies, those are pan channel cut letters. They're just mounted onto a, um, I think sometimes it's called a raceway, basically a panel. Here's some more. We haven't gotten any comments from the public or from our reviewing agencies about this application. And here that we can refer to again, if you'd like, um, this is just grouping all of the seven same variance criteria that we just discussed. Um, all seven of these have to be met in order to approve the applicant's request. 
And so I will then read you some more text. Um, this is staff's analysis. Uh, variance criteria number one, the subject property has an exceptional shape, topography, building configuration, or other exceptional site condition that is not a general condition throughout the zone district. We do feel that it has some unique constraints, um, being that it, uh, it, it has its own sign code, Matt, the master sign code that we talked about um, that applies just to this area of the town and, and does exceed um, the, the municipal code's regular uh, sign requirements. It goes above and beyond those. So we do think it meets that one. Number two, the strict application of the code standards for which a variance is sought would produce on heart, undue hardship. We do think it does that. The applicant did not create the hardship by his or her, her own actions. Um, we think it was the city's changing regulations that caused that hardship. Number four, the variance requested does not harm the public and does not impair the intent or purposes of this code, goals, and policies, including the specific regulation for which the variance is sought. Um, we do think it meets that. We don't think there's any harm to the public and the master sign plan already exceeds code requirements. Number five, the variance request demonstrates exceptional hardship not related to purposes of convenience or financial burden. Um, we think this request has more to do with aesthetic concerns and not convenience. Uh, number six, the variance request will not violate building or fire code requirements. Uh, we do not think it does. And then number seven, the variance request, the, the variance is the minimum variance that will afford relief uh, for the subject standards of the code. We do think it does that. It requests to move one stipulation from one page of the master sign plan. For this one, there's only one action plan. Um, and specifically what the language is, is to request variance request to eliminate requirement on sheet 3.1 of the Glenwood Meadows master sign plan involving the return colors or signs with internally illuminated individual pan channel letters. Uh, so the staff does recommend approval of it. Um, code compliant alternatives, maintaining the status quo is all I can come up with for them. Um, if you all wish to deny the variance, um, then you would need to make a finding for how this does not meet uh, at least one of these seven criteria. So, um, you know, any one of these individually or combinations thereof, and it would, it, maybe you could find, uh, make a finding to deny. Um, so that's all I have for you. Um, I'll turn it over to you guys for, for questions. Great. Thanks, Watkins. Um, any questions from the commission? John. What was the intent of uh, having the returns match the billing color? Was it to minimize visual impact? Is it not known? Mm, I wouldn't say I know exactly what they mean. Um, you know, there may have been some kind of aesthetic concern, uh, you know, matching the primary masonry color. I wouldn't say that necessarily makes sense, given that signs can be whatever color they want to be. That, that's all I know. Thank you. So um, can there be illumination coming from the sides? It, you know, if they're painted, I, you know, I assume it wouldn't, but without the paint, is there any reason for that, uh, you know, from a visual standpoint of uh, visual pollution or something? Um, I'm not aware of any any um, reason that they couldn't, you know, if they were if they were painted to match primary racing colors, then there probably would not be any light trespass, but I'm not aware of any kind of negative impacts that would result from that, if there were light trespass. Mm -hmm. So you don't think it's part of the reasoning behind that then? I noticed, that, I can't remember which uh, entity it was, it looked like they had, it was white going all the way back. Yeah, um, that that could be. I could think of other ways to try to eliminate that if that were the goal. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Okay, Carolyn. Um, it seems as though a lot of the properties that are in Meadows are not currently following this sign code. Um, so one of my questions is how? What is the reason that we haven't been um, assuring compliance over there? Um, my second comment is that uh, even when the pan channel signs are fabricated, it's less than likely that the signs are actually painted. They might be a different color or they might be metal. So to me, this seems, uh, well, I guess that would be a more comment than question, uh, but why haven't we um, pursued uh, remedying the, the signs that are not compliant out there? You know, it's it's a good question, and I have not done the research to try to find each each sign. You know, I haven't 
compiled a database of which ones comply and which ones don't and, and the reasons for them. Um, some of them may have been issued sign permits incorrectly. Um, we, we may have done that as a city over the years. Uh, some of the signs do comply. So it looks like it wasn't, it hasn't been ignored at all times. What I would say is that, um, you know, we have to, as staff, we have to follow the rules and the rules are what they are. Uh, and so the applicant has indicated that they would not like to continue doing this in the future. So they're obligated to change the rules. I'm sure that has something to do with the individual businesses branding. As we know, some of those are formula stores or chain stores. Um, do those stores sometimes come to staff requesting uh, that their signs be consistent with their other um, their other locations? You know, I might save that question for the applicant. I think okay. You address that. Okay. Thank you. So they they need to get a sign uh, sign permit with the city, like anybody else in the city, correct? That's correct. Is there any other entity in in the meadows that uh, you have to go through any kind of approval process for, for a sign or anything else? Is, or does it all go through the city applying their regulations in, in some cases? It, it goes through us and I believe they have, um, the applicant might be able to mention, yeah, they, they have their own internal process um, and, and then it comes to us like a normal sign permit. Okay, all right. So it has to go through that process before going to the city. I don't know too much about that process, and uh, that might be another one we could leave for the applicant to discuss. Okay. Well, would the applicant care to come forward and present? Scott Goldhammer uh, with Miller United Real Estate. Thank you guys for coming tonight. For coming and listening to the color of the color of a letter on a sign in a building. It's a little complicated. Although our sign plan has been around for about 19 years, so we've only had two variances. It's held pretty well. This one, um, I think Watkins brought it up. I don't think I've ever had anybody question why we're having the color of the letter, the side of the letter, not match the building um, veneer or, or, or block or color matching the masonry color, right? Um, there are a few signs out there that do that. And I think those were the signs that were done earlier, but I think a couple of things have sort of matured over that 20 year period of time. One of them was, on the back side of the building, facing the large parking fields. I should start over. There's three types of signs you can have on a building. There's an internally illuminated pan channel letter, and that can go on the back side of any building or on the big fronts of those buildings that are the box buildings. On Market Street, you can't have an internally illuminated pan channel letter. It can be a halo letter, or it can be an externally illuminated letter. Well, none of those have restrictions on what the color of that pan channel could be on, the, on either the halo or the externally illuminated. Well, neither one of those two sign types works on the back of the building because you've got a parking field that's a football field long. You want the internally illuminated pan channel letter LED sign facing that large parking field. So I've been pushing that to all the people that are in Market Street to have that internally illuminated pan channel letter. Well, T-Mobile has a brand, as you indicated earlier. The brand is white letters on a pink panel. If you tried making the side of those letters to match the color of the masonry, you're going to have sort of an orangish color letter on the T-Mobile on the pink panel with a white letter. That doesn't fly. Flares was the actual example that we used. Big purple letter, white signs on it, internally illuminated facing the parking field. I don't think that anybody's really ever called us on this yet, but I think because of the type of sign that's really required in that application, um, this particular paragraph may or may not have gotten, I give Watkins credit, he'd pick up on it. Here we are 19 years later. He's like, well, why are we doing this? Well, if you look at the variety of signs out there, including the big box tenant signs, Target would have to change the color of their red bullet sign to match the color of the masonry on their building. Bed, Bath and Beyond, Alta Beauty. I mean, just right down, the, right down the line, Petco. Every one of those would have had to have had a masonry colored internally pan channel letter, masonry color side panel on their signs, which none of them do. So why did this come up now and why didn't it come up in year one? <laughs> I, I really don't know the answer to that other than the brand for a lot of those big national brand names, um, there's really not a question as to whether you can satisfy that. 
Walmart's going to require they're going to have that white pan channel letter on the side of their on, on their letter, on an internally eliminated pan channel letter. So it only seems natural that this was something of an architectural feature, I think, that um, an architect thought, well, we've got a pan channel letter on the outside of a building to have it match the color of the masonry probably is aesthetically uh, pleasing. The light doesn't illuminate through the side or that return of the letter. There's no illumination whatsoever. So if you're looking up at it and it may be during the day, the side of the letter may blend in a little bit better with the architecture of the masonry, but certainly not, not, not important that it does. I would tell you that the majority of the signs out there, the majority of these signs that are out there, um, could I say majority? I think I could. Do not have matching side letter or returns on the letters for internally illuminated pan channels versus the externally illuminated or the halo because that's not required to have the color of the masonry so it just makes more sense to say look whatever the reason this small paragraph was added at that time it's not been adhered to very well over the last 19 years and it's a constraint when you come to the national brand retailers a very 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 big constraint is they would be forced to then using an alternative sign that would not be illuminated in that big parking field. They would have to put goosenecks on a sign that you could see maybe three parking miles away. And that's a big constraint on those national retailers. Did that answer any questions? <laughs> it's a, it's a complicated issue, but um, no, one, no one cares what the color of the side of the letter is. No one really cares except the retailer. Then they're very, very, very caring about that. Folks like T-Mobile or Players or Targets, and especially the big boxes of the world, they they want their they want their brand. Okay. Does that help? Thanks, Scott. Any questions for the applicant? No. Well, then I'll open the uh, item up to the public for any public comments or. Questions? I see no one here in the council chambers and I don't believe there's anybody online either. So I'll close the public comment period and bring it back up to the commission for a motion. The staff is recommending uh, approval on this variance item. Motion to Matthew, accept. Matthew, sorry. So no, I make a motion to accept staff's uh, recommendation to approve the variance. Okay. With conditions on page six and seven. Yes. Findings. Findings. Okay. Six and seven. Um, Gregory, please. Uh, I second. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Sims and a second by Commissioner Cowan to approve the variance request for the Meadow sign change. Any other further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Watkins. So moving on with the agenda, item C. Amendments to Title 070 of the Municipal Code related to site and building design standards and the variety of housing types. And Hannah is here to make that presentation. Good evening, Planning and Zoning Commission. Let's just get this set up. Great, uh, Hannah Klausman, Director of Community and Economic Development, as you all know, but I'm supposed to say that because it says so right here. <laughs> um, so this is a topic that we brought up last time that we we're going to discuss at this meeting, um, talking about housing variety. So as I mentioned before that this is a code amendment. So we go through the code amendment process. Planning and Zoning Commission is a recommending body to city council. So whatever your decision is tonight, you'd be recommending approval or denial. You can completely change what staff has written as a proposal tonight. 
but at the very end, it is a recommendation to city council and then city council would be the final approving authority on the code amendment. It's an ordinance, so then it would take two readings to pass um, with council and then it would go into effect if that is what both of these commissions choose. So what we're talking about, and I will bring up the section of code, I don't have a presentation for you tonight because I feel like this is going to be more, <laughs> This is more of a very meaty discussion and um, a lot of opinions about housing and what housing looks like, what we've gotten as far as housing. I know I've made a pre presentation to you about um, the types of residential building permits that we've had over the last six years. So that's to kind of prepare you for these topics. So we're talking about section 704080, which is our residential site and building design code. I'm going to bring that up just so that we can be viewing it um, while we're talking about it. It's very hot mic. Maybe I should show you how I'm getting to it so you guys can all know yourselves. Let's do that. That sounds like fun. Maybe. Yeah. No, she's getting ready. Yes. So if somebody's in the background, they're going to be asking. Okay. No, he's That's different. Um, but just to help. Yeah, so okay. That's... Don't just blow through it. Right. Got it. Thank you. Thanks for the direction. Great. Um, so right now I'm going into the city's municipal code. Um, you guys know Title 70 fairly well. This is our development code. Title uh, Article 7040 is our development standards. So this is what our planners review when we have any type of um, project come in. And I'm going to go down to 704080, which is our residential site and building design standards. So this is what we take any residential project that comes in through on our code. Um, and I'm going to scroll down. We have dimensional standards and setbacks, lot coverage, all the topics you can think of, even down to refuse containers. So here we're getting to residential building design and character. And within design and character, we talk about a variety of housing types. Uh, so currently, if a development proposal comes in that's over three acres large, they are required to provide two types of housing in that list that you can see there. If it is over six acres large, they have to provide three types of housing. And the list includes detached single family dwellings, accessory dwelling units, two family dwellings, so we're talking about a duplex, single family townhouse dwellings, so those are attached product, but still single family, or multifamily dwellings other than duplex or townhouse dwellings. So that is what a developer currently can choose from to meet the standards. And the reason why we're having this discussion is for a long time, development sought variances from this section of code and were granted them. Um, when we changed our development code in 2018, we changed our variance process. And so granting a variance became a little bit more challenging. As you guys are aware, you just sat through two. Um, and so what we saw, the first large residential project to come through was required to meet the standard. They met the standard. And then what resulted was maybe not what city council and members of the community actually intended for that standard to be. And that is up for discussion as well. So the project that went through um, has 100 units, uh, 98 of which are apartment dwelling units, and two in the form of a duplex. So you can see that. Um, up for discussion, but that might not be the balance that the code was intending to get at. So that has been brought up to staff as maybe something to review and look at. Um, and in reviewing that section of code, uh, there's a lot of different aspects that we can look at. Staff has proposed some examples for you to consider tonight. And then I think we need to have a larger discussion about possibly adding some other categories. And you might have some categories to add to that list that you think are appropriate that really get to the intent of a variety of housing units. So um, 
see here. In the staff report, I did include, stop sharing my screen. I did include um, the intent codes that are listed in our residential site and design standards to explain to planning and zoning commission what, what, what we're truly after here. Um, and so some of those include protecting context sensitive infill and redevelopment. And a key one here is avoiding repetitive patterns of residential development. So, there, so there's an aesthetic component here as well and not having large blocks of repetitive architectural residential units and that's identified in the intent. Um, also reinforcing the diversity of architectural styles, increasing predictability. So this is transparency for the developer about what the city wants to see when these projects come in. Maximizing the quality and longevity of neighborhoods through durable materials, ensuring that massing and height of infill is compatible and reducing visual impacts of street oriented garages and things of that nature. Um, so really getting back to some of those intent, if you need something to look at, I wanted to include that. What staff has written for you tonight um, includes a suggestion to make an edit to the non uh, residential site and building design as well as non-residential and mixed use site design because our non-residential site and mixed use design standards do not include this at all. There is not a requirement for a mixed use project that comes in to provide a variety of housing if they are incorporating a residential use. So that's something for discussion tonight as well. Um, we've included some information on possibly looking at variety of bedroom count as, as a category. Um, and if you guys have questions about the types of developments and their variety of bedroom counts that have come in, we can certainly discuss that. Um, the one thing I do want to bring up before we kind of dive into this discussion is um, just calling out potential impacts when we're changing code. Um, as we're applying standards to residential and mixed use, what we do, what we change does have real world implications for cost feasibility of projects. And as we all know, that's not the only argument, right? It's a balance between that and also aesthetic and benefit to the community. I just always like to call out so that we're thinking about that when we're going through our criteria and staff analysis. I have included an analysis of what we have put on the table as a proposal um, with criteria for a code amendment. So consistent with the comprehensive plan, not conflicting with other provisions of this code, necessary to address a demonstrated community need, necessary to respond to substantial changes and conditions in policy, and consistent with the general purpose and intent of this code. Um, and staff has provided an analysis, but we can get into those more specific if you have questions. Um, some of the other categories that are not included in your staff report that I'm gonna throw out um, is the idea that these categories can include possibly an affordability component. So providing a variety of housing as presented is really talking about um, the unit type and kind of aesthetic feel of single family homes and multifamily homes. Um, but there is an opportunity here to also consider can affordability be a type? And what I mean about that is we have our inclusionary zoning, which has community housing standards for the percentage of requirements for deed restricted units in a project. Um, but something to consider tonight is getting into um, could these categories include higher um, community housing restrictions as a type to provide um, AMI restrictions? So we have area median income restrictions on our inclusionary zoning, and that restricts what uh, a unit can be sold for or rented for based on income levels. Uh, we also have something called resident occupancy, which limits not so much what it can be rented or sold for, but who can rent or own the unit, being someone that works within specific geographic boundaries. I can go into those boundaries. And then, you know, a category of such a percentage of affordable versus free market and appreciation caps, um, which would only apply to for sale units. That's a lot of information. This is a heavy topic, so I expect a lot of questions. And I'm going to lean heavily on our legal counsel to help out here as you guys navigate what you think these categories should look like. And ultimately, 
it is our hope that we arrive at a recommendation to then take with further staff analysis on what you say and present it to city council for consideration. So staff did not provide you with a recommendation, but I have provided you with the tools so that you can make a recommendation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah. Um, yes, this is uh, meaty at, <laughs> at, at least. Um, well, I, I think you started touching on something that I was thinking about in, in terms of how these restrictions, particularly thinking about the larger um, projects and how um, inclusionary overlays with this. And if I understood you right, you were saying that affordability could be a type. And that means aesthetically, architecturally, we wouldn't be gaining anything, I guess, right? Yes. So with that, so we, type, you're getting more at utility and, and who can, with the affordability, you're not going to get necessarily the architectural variety that part of these um, standards are aimed at, right? Of having, let's say, a six acre parcel that has some apartment buildings and townhomes next to it, and then some other duplexes. I think we can all visualize what that looks like. And it, it does sound like a nice community. I think I, I pointed out um, as far as social diversity goes, when you have a variety of housing types, um, that provides for social diversity. But in that intent in itself, if you're providing for different levels of income type, you're also maybe even further providing for social diversity. Hmm. So it's a type, but it, it's not that one. The affordability would not necessarily be getting at the aesthetic architectural feature side of this standard. What, what answered your question? <laughs> no, that's that's good information. Um, I, I'm thinking, you know, I don't know where there is a six acre parcel, but there must be some somewhere in the city. Um, the likelihood of that being a PUD would be very strong, I would assume, right? So they would be creating their own um parameters and design and so forth um but not necessarily having to address this code right uh pud would be outside of these parameters and um richard can probably speak to that process but you're absolutely right it's the pud process is more similar to kind of an annexation where it's it's a negotiation and setting standards within a pud the requirement is usually that they at least meet the minimum intent of the city's code and provide further benefit through um, a greater aesthetic appeal or greater benefit. That's so, what we're writing PUD regulations. That's usually what that is aimed at. So we're having these parameters set in the code would. It would provide a base. Yeah. Yes. This is what, this is the base of what we want. And then with a PUD coming in, we would certainly look to that. And if they want something outside of our code, they do have to prove to planning and zoning and city council that they're improving upon our code. Mm -hmm. So you're right that that would be the base standard. And then they would need to show that they either meet it or are providing for it through different mechanisms to meet the same intent. The other, you know, thinking about inclusionary and, and affordability, um, have you ever done a sort of an overlay of how this code and the affordability inclusionary aspect, you know, what that looks like in a in a potential plan. Conceptually inside of my brain, yes. <laughs> As a true I would love to, I would love to go in there and see that. <laughs> it's it's in there. Um, but no, not not like fully concept based. So that would certainly be something we want to look at. And you could make recommendations. To and I think your comment about affordability, you know, keeping that in mind in terms of what the developer is going to be talking about. And I think anecdotally, we are receiving that feedback from developers, um, you know, that as, as the product gets more expensive for them to build with a diversity of units, then 
they have a less of a, an ability to deliver an affordable inclusionary development or incentive yeah yes so i think um thank you for bringing that up richard we do have in in talking with developers and talking about this possible code change um, we have had comments back and this has always been the issue with this section of code is that developers that comply with this section are incurring more costs so the cost of the development goes up and we all know where usually those costs end and it's with the end user um, so there's a balance there also that you have to strike with the standards that you adopt you may end up making a project um, less feasible financially so it doesn't actually occur um, and so we're trying to strike that balance as well if you have an affordable uh, housing project that's coming in and they could count one of their categories as providing a certain level of AMI units um, you know an example to give you a real world example of this um, I think most of you are familiar but low income housing tax credits is a program from the state and so projects apply for those tax credits and if they receive those tax credits are able to provide basically housing subsidies down to area median income levels of 40%. And so to give you an idea of the rent that that would be, we're talking in the 400 to $500 range for one bedroom, which my eyes bulge at that <laughs> idea, right? That's, not, that's just not something we see. And so when you have a project that's seeking those tax credits and they come in and they have to go through our process, um, the standards as written right now could be a little bit prohibitive. And so if they had a category that they could meet, that they're saying we provide 100% of our project at or below 80% area median income, and that qualifies as a category, then they actually have an avenue where they're providing a slightly different type of housing, right? Different variety of housing, but still a different type in the intent. <clears throat> Seems like that would almost be necessary to call that a type, Is it, you know, from just talking off the top of my head, obviously, but otherwise it's going to be prohibitive, at least based on what we've seen come in here with the various projects, you know, they're, they're not diverse at all. And so anyway, um, Matthew. Please. Does this make the code more uh, tie into the comprehensive plan overall then, or more mesh excellent, and help meet that? Excellent point. Yeah. Um, with our newly adopted comprehensive plan update, there was more of a focus on affordability and variety of housing. So it is with changes that it would include those components if you're recommending that tonight. It certainly would meet some of the goals and strategies that are identified in that update. Carolyn. Carolyn, please. I uh, do worry about creating a housing type called affordability because to me, it sounds like they're going to build it really cheaply and it will be garbage. And you might have a few other nice looking houses near it. And then this is the projects, you know, and, and I don't think that's the community's intent here. Although we, of course, are focused on providing more affordable housing. I think it's really a risk to call a housing type affordability. Um, however, I understand the implications that this could have for developers um, to have multiple um, building types. Now, it is, is a townhouse like always stacked up and they have the whole thing between party walls? Like how does a townhouse differ from an apartment from a duplex? Sure. And our definition section of our code is very useful here because we mm -hmm. get this question a lot. So a townhouse will always have ground floor access. So you'll always have that front door that's on the ground and it's a unit to itself. Whereas condominiums, if it's for sale product, will be stacked. And not every, not every unit has access to the ground, the street level. Um, and apartments can be the same way, but apartments obviously are the rental product of the condominium. Can a townhouse be only one level? Yes. It basically means single family product attached with every unit having ground floor access to okay. their unit. Okay. Um, an another, um, besides my concern about uh, creating affordability as a housing type, um, 
I read in the report that we we really don't have very many parcels left that are over three or over six acres. So something we might want to discuss is should we lower the threshold of acreage in order for the existing or the proposed um, housing type differences to apply? Yes, so something to consider, um, lowering the threshold of acreage side or possibly moving to a unit-based count. So depending on, you know, if you have a three acre or a six acre parcel and it's residential, we're expecting quite a few units. That's what this was designed around, but you're right. We certainly don't have um, many vacant three or six acre parcels. Um, so really we're looking at redevelopment parcels that come in, um, but lowering that standard and maybe tying it to the unit count of the project itself gives you a better feel of the scale of the project. So that's also a consideration for recommending a change to this instead of acreage based on 50 units, 100 yeah. units, you know, whatever you think is appropriate given scale. And we can talk about the scale of projects that have come in and their density. Um, but that is an option available to you as well. Do I recall hearing that the Safeway property is four acres? Just to get a, you know, my head around how big does three acres look? The lot at 19th and Grand, the parcel at 19th and Grand is how I'm going to refer to that property, um, is over three acres. So okay. if it were to develop, uh, this standard as it's written in code now would apply. Okay. Do we have any developments that have been on one acre or, or do you know offhand how many, how, is there a housing unit maximum that would be allowed per one acre? Um, that is a zoning district question. Okay. And um, that sheet, if you guys remember the spreadsheet, Hannah's housing spreadsheet that I showed you last time, um, breaks down what the acreage is of a parcel and the number of units so we can get a density per acre. We don't limit density per acre. Um, it's limited by factors of providing sufficient parking and landscaping and amenities and engineering standards. Lot coverage. So you basically, the engineers and the designers get together and they start putting these things on the land and suddenly they find where they can plot the footprint and how high they can go. And then they kind of determine, well, we want to do one, two or three bedrooms and this is how much space it is. So that's how many units gets there. So quite a potential variety of, of unit, num numbers of units could be on any one acre parcel. Sure. Yeah. And just to give some examples of the some projects, um, residential projects in the last six years, we've had an apartment complex that has 40 units. We have an apartment complex with 88 units, 36 units, 100 units, and then kind of a phased construction altogether that's 188 units. So it does vary widely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and just for clarification, that's all in our upper level zones. Our residential zones have limitations of how many units per acre you can put. In our mixed use um, housing types, uh, you said that we don't have any housing type variety requirements at this time. Have we imposed affordability on residential uses and a mixed use development? Mixed use developments are subject to our inclusionary zoning standards. They are. So currently, um, if it's a rental project, 20% uh, of the units need to be deed restricted to affordability. If it's a for sale project, as you guys know, because you wrote this code, <laughs> it's 10%. And that was in order to incentivize homes for sale. I would say it was for to sure. not place a burden on for sale projects. Right, yeah. right. Not okay. place a further burden. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Gregory. Thank you. And I guess that may have led to the 10%, just kind of um, where you settled with 10% in this, was that kind of speaking to what Colleen just brought forward as far as incentivizing possible for sale units or addressing concerns from developers or kind of, I guess, where did this 10% um, threshold come from? And I think the 10% that's in your staff report is referencing as an option. I'm going back to it just so I can. And I can pull this up so you guys can see in the text version of the code. Sure. 
Um, so what Gregory is talking about in the categories, staff has proposed, this is just an example of what you could do um, in reference to the different bedroom count configurations. So each bedroom type shall be a minimum of 10% of the total dwelling units. Um, why this was included is in looking back at our past projects, we really have had a variety of bedroom counts provided in all of the projects that I just mentioned. There's some that are a little bit more focused on studio or efficiency, but they have included some two bedroom or even like one or two, three bedroom, but it's been kind of token. And so to get a true variety, if that's what you're looking at, some type of percentage threshold. So again, you don't have a 40 unit apartment complex that has one three bedroom and the rest are studios because that really doesn't get to the intent of the variety, right? So 10% was kind of a starting point and we can talk about what that looks like. So in a 40 unit apartment complex, if they were to use this category and they, they would have to provide three, bed, three distinct bedroom counts and they'd each need to at least represent 10% of the total. So four units of studio, four units of one bedroom, four units of two bedroom would meet that standard. If that seems like sufficient diversity in that building, so you would have at least 12 units there and the rest could be all studios per se. Um, so staff isn't necessarily tied to that threshold, but more of an example and a starting point. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, I guess that distinction by type is, I guess an important distinction to make versus 10% of the total. Um, because I guess when I look at it, getting the, getting the stink eye back there. Um, I guess when you look at, it's something I was thinking about when I was looking at these percentages was perhaps, and I'm not a developer, but you just kind of think about economies of scale. And if you're coming into a project that if you've got some certainty of of what you are being asked to do, um, you know, if it's a, a representative small sample, that can be a little bit of an exception um, to your general rule that you're applying for, that you're building, that you're um, that you're doing. And so maybe in, in some context, it would make sense to increase that percentage, perhaps not necessarily across all types, but maybe um, to kind of take a scalpel to it and look at some particular types that we can identify as particular needs. Um, and I'm just going back and referencing, <clears throat> if you recall the, the housing conversation we had, they presented the Summit County kind of breakdown of AMI and professions falling within those percentages. And it was a uh, a fairly revealing um, analysis that they did where so many of our, you know, kind of core um, professional, you know, professions, um, essential services fall in that kind of 60% category. Um, and so when I look at this and, and just kind of the general intent is, again, kind of that totality of not any just one thing, but how can we be creative and look at a variety of solutions, um, from that percentage um, is it across all types, specific types that are maybe more targeted toward um, AMI uh, targets that we want to hit. Um, maybe there's some examples in, in neighboring communities, because my sense is that the ask here is likely the developing, like the norm, right, that we're seeing in, in these mountain communities like Glenwood. Like we're not unique as far as identifying these needs and constraints that we have insofar as development, lack of inventory and things like that. Um, so I guess I kind of spun out with that there, but um, <laughs> I, I guess it's just, topic. yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's really well done and, and great job just kind of distilling it down and, and just, you know, uh, two and a half pages is, is pretty remarkable. Um, and it just, yeah, it opens up a lot of discussion, but it's, it's certainly something that needs to be had, so. And Gregory, you, you bring up, um, a good point that reminded me of something I wanted to mention, because with code amendments, usually what you see staff bring to you is a lovely HANA spreadsheet of what everyone else is doing, right? Um, so we like to compare codes mostly because we don't like to write it all ourselves <laughs> and invent it from the ground up. Um, and so I did reach out to similar sized communities, um, tourist oriented communities, communities that are experiencing the housing crisis, which could be said is every community in Colorado and across the nation, um, to get an idea if they, first off, if they have any standards like we do, and second off, if they are considering any standards. And across the board, I got no, um, as it's related to the variety of housing types that we have. And so I think what most jurisdictions are moving forwards with, 
housing variety. And you've seen these conversations from Summit and Breckenridge, um, places that are also experiencing the housing crisis very acutely, is looking at those requirements on the affordability side. And so that's why um, you know, internally we're talking about those other components adding as a category itself because they have a heavy benefit for the community. And, and truly, um, you know, if we're looking at what the city needs and what the city wants based on studies, you're absolutely right. We have more need in the lower AMI categories than we do in the higher. John, please. Uh, as the proposed amendment is written, um, just to be clear, like you, the example you were just giving a four unit building, if there were four units each of differing bedroom types and some multifamily structure, does that meet two housing types? Yes. The bedroom count as well as the multifamily. Those are the two types. Right. Okay. As the proposal is written. Thank you. Um, what constitutes a live work as opposed to a um, two bedroom or? That's a great question that's also contained in our definitions section. <laughs> oh, good. Um, and I can go there just to give you the exact answer because it is a little, there's quite a bit of nuance to what a live work unit is. Uh, let me see if I can go there real quick. Any rules and definitions. Um, because it has specific requirements for where the residential unit is versus where the work unit is. And I'll go back. I'm using the search function, Carolyn, that you're very fond of. Love it. Um, so definition, this is in our definitions of use categories and specific use types. In residential uses, we have household living, live work right at the top, is a dwelling unit combining both a residential living space and also an integrated workspace principally used by one or more of the residents the unit typically has a storefront, workspace or studio and public display area on the ground floor with residential located either on the upper floor or in the back of the workspace. That's a mouthful, but that's a live work unit. So a sort of a presence on the street or on the, it wouldn't have to be on the street level though, would it? it would... Not necessarily. It talks about having a display area on the ground floor. So something that's visible on you the know, ground floor. On okay. the ground floor. And then residences can, you know, we have some examples of this. There's not a ton, um, but live work units. We have a, a nail salon in town that has the nail salon up front. And then there's the actual residence of the proprietors in the back. And it has to be a, um, the resident, the proprietor has to live in that space. Right. So it's not just a residential unit for anyone, it's a residential unit of someone that's working, running, owning, doing something with the business. So they're connected. Could be an employee. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Carolyn. Um, do we restrict uh, live work units by zone district? We do, yes. And but if it's on the second floor, it cannot be a live work unit per your definition. Because it says ground floor. Um, of course, I'm get, you're grilling me on the one topic that we don't apply very <laughs> often. If I have to think about my answers a little bit more thoroughly, um, I'm going to our use table. I don't think that's the case because you could have a two-story like mixed use commercial building where there is access for people to walk by and engage with the business, which I think is the intent there. So a public space, not necessarily ground floor, but a public accessible. Right. So it's not what we're getting at here. The main difference is it's not a home occupation. A home occupation, you can have a home office, right? In your house that mm -hmm. you sell things on Etsy, let's say. Right. But you don't engage with the public. The public's not coming into your space. That's not a true live work unit, okay. even though you are living and working in the unit. <laughs> Um, the live work unit, as we defined and added to our code, is really meant to provide living space adjacent to, in conjunction with that working space that has an engaging um, public aspect to it. So a live work unit could be, could it be considered a housing type? 
is it considered a housing type? It's not a townhouse? Or... It's a different type, yes. I've, as we've applied it, it is completely separate housing type to itself. It's not currently in that list of categories. So it'd be something to think about of how it functions and whether you think that that should apply here as far as variety of housing. So probably, uh, I mean, and, and I haven't memorized the code. Uh, so live, live work units would probably be allowed in like a high density residential or in a mixed use zone district. Yes, it wouldn't be in our lower density residential because right. it wouldn't, we, in our lower density residential zone districts, we restrict commercial activity more. Yeah. So the further you go up in our zoning table, when you get into M2, which is mixed use, um, commercial zoning districts, those are more flexible on the types of uses they allow. And so really a live work unit is directed at those types of zones. Um, and when George was speaking about the number of bedrooms, like the bedroom count qualifying as different housing types is, I'm a little confused on that. Is, is, so if you have a studio, a one bedroom and some three bedrooms, that's not three housing types. No, it, so in the proposal that we included, and this was just an idea that you could include bedroom type as a category. It would be, that would be allowing a lot of flexibility on the developer side, right? That they would be able to choose that as a category. Um, but so it's combining them all together. That so you'd have to provide three and each of the three would need to represent 10% of the total to, to get at that true variety. So to get at one of their housing types. One category. Okay, yes. so one Okay, I think I understand that now. And just because I have it up, oh, it's gone now, but I can verbally tell you. So a dwelling, live work, live work dwelling is only allowed starting in our residential transitional zone district, mm -hmm. as you can see with this P right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you can see that it's blank for all the zone districts below, which those are our lower density residential zones. So single family neighborhoods are slightly you know, duplex, triplex neighborhoods, you're mm -hmm. not, a live work unit is not an allowed housing type. Okay, but if we so decide a live work unit in the permitted zone districts could be a, one of the variety of unit types. It could be a category, but what you just brought up is another layer of the zoning onion. Yeah. It could only apply if the project is in these zone districts. Understood. Which when we're talking about some of the higher unit residential projects, we don't have high unit residential projects proposed in the rural residential, residential low density, residential medium density, because we have restrictions there for how many units you can have. These large projects are locating in, um, usually from our mixed, mixed use one and two up through commercial. RH is a residential high density though, right? It is high density, but it still has restrictions on commercial. Okay. So we still haven't gotten quite to the full flexibility of commercial and you mm -hmm. know to the mixed use component of the code. Okay, clear as mud. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Carolyn. After tonight, I, uh, we're all going to know the code front and back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Hannah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm thinking the if, if commission uh, pursues affordability as a housing type, that it would look similar in the code as to the unit types. There'd be kind of a menu mm -hmm. of different affordability strategies. And I, I think we'd want to be very aggressive. If, if, if the development is going to get relief, I mean, put it that way, it, it is relief from some of this more burdensome requirements. We, we need to be talking about 100% resident occupancy, 80% pegged to AMI, like very, very high numbers. Yes, very good point. And, and so as you look at the suite of options that staff proposed, obviously we don't have that affordability um, into our proposal yet. So I really wanna get your feel, are those categories you wanna include? And then to Richard's point, to what level, right? So this would be allowing flexibility. So talk about, we're offering something, what's the benefit that we get back? And talking about making that fairly aggressive. Oops. Uh, John, please. Has there been any discussion about how that affordability, affordability housing type plays with inclusionary zoning and um, does it supersede that requirement? Has so there been any discussion? Thinking, I'm going to try and um, shoot from the hip here in the <laughs> code. <laughs> 
So let's all do it together. Really get our code brains on. So you've got inclusionary zoning. Inclusionary zoning requires 20% of the units for any project that's over 10 units. So it can be a small project and you're still required to contribute. So that's got a 20% threshold. This housing variety component, if they're truly going to use affordability as a category, would be above and beyond what inclusionary zoning requires. Because we've already got that. We're getting that no matter what. And no matter the size. Voluntary. And and voluntary. So many layers. Yeah. So in my mind, and Richard, jump in here if I get this wrong, the inclusionary zoning is our base that we're going to apply to anything over 10. And then this, when you get into larger parcels, or if we decide to do it based on unit base, let's say we're throwing out 50, a 50 unit project, 20% of it, if it's rental, needs to be deed restricted. And they would then need to provide, let's say, two housing types. One is multifamily. Wrong finger there. My <laughs> <laughs> no offense taken. <laughs> One is multifamily. And then possibly another category is that 80% of their units are um, resident occupied. So then you're going above and beyond. So I would say if we're thinking about changing this code, it would be adding on to the requirements and getting more of that affordability than our inclusionary zoning is currently at. Fingers aside. Thank you. Carolyn. So if affordability is a housing type and we're requiring three housing types, affordability could be one and then they'd still have to have like apartments and townhouses or duplexes and mm -hmm. you know actual real housing types because I just affordability is just not in my mind a housing type um, but I it's a financial type it is and I do have faith in our design standards that you know it probably wouldn't look all that bad I'm glad you got there I, meant, <laughs> I wrote myself a note this is um, this is know, almost an apology what I've heard from you is risky for design but these projects, no matter what the unit type is, is subject to our design standards, which are fairly thorough. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, whether it's an affordable unit or whether it's a townhouse or whether it's a single family home, we have standards that are going to apply across the board. Um, so we don't we don't let things get too ugly or um, and that's truly what this standard um, is aimed at. Right. One of the standards that we apply to make things not monochromatic or bright white or um, snout houses with garages that face that are out you know from I think that was a 70s thing planners hate snout houses um, so it the same design concepts that we apply to any other project would apply to those units as well right so I, at first I think I was overly concerned because I thought if it was designated affordable then they would be sort of waived from the variety of housing types, but that's not the case. It doesn't have to be the case. Right. Okay. Okay. That helps. Thanks. April. Um, and forgive me if I'm like missing something in the code, but in terms of not just in terms of aesthetic standards, right. But in terms of design standards, as they relate to how sustainable an affordable housing complex might be like how, how the building is made so it's not necessarily falling apart and cheaper to build but like sustainable in terms of materials and um, being able to withstand people many people living there of all different backgrounds and we do have some language in the code um, that is directed at durability of materials um, so staff reviews the types of building materials that's being proposed so there's a design criteria for the aesthetic, but then there's also a durability component. And there are some building uh, materials that we don't allow. And so if a project comes in and we review it and we see that they're providing, um, I'm forgetting the exact name of it, but it's a off brand of stucco. Um, thank you, EFIS. Um, EFIS is currently prohibited in our code um, as a building type. <laughs> <laughs> and whether you like EFIS or not. So we do have some code language that would apply. I would say our sustainability aspects are growing as we start looking at some of those um, technological advancements in building design. 
And additionally, the adopted building codes, which are separate from 070, there's the building code, the energy efficiency code, all of which I think we had just adopted 21. So yes. <clears throat> they've been really ratcheting those up in terms of uh, actual energy use of uh, especially multifamily buildings. Excellent point. Another code <laughs> on the top of this one that our building official um, does all the reviews for to make sure that they're meeting 2021 standards, which we just adopted last year. Thanks. Gregory. Uh, I guess kind of moving over to the, um, I guess the recognition of the lack of inventory for these parcels, if we're talking parcels um, and the, the staff recommendation to review if that is still something that's appropriate for this conversation as we look at contextualizing this um, and perhaps amending things and looking at the per unit basis. Um, I guess it's kind of, what are your thoughts on that distinction and perhaps looking at it by unit versus parcel size, maybe from what you've seen elsewhere? Oh, two questions. Um, I would say, you know, if you guys make recommendations tonight that you want to move to that type of threshold, staff would certainly put in some work in between now and going to council um, to kind of vet that those levels based on the building permits that we've received, reviewing our history and what we kind of get and what is perceived as like a larger project, because um, that is that can be very subjective. So I'd want to I'd want to get some at least some base feelings from you guys on you know how big does a project need to be to start incorporating variety and we can start talking about real examples if you want um, of buildings that you think are too big and too um, what was the word in code you know it all looks the same um, so I'm not sure that I have a full answer for you today but we can throw around some ideas and then staff could do a little bit more background on it to come up with a recommendation when we get to city council in addition to your recommendation if it's different. Oh, I avoided your question expertly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have the the level of 10 in some of our code, right, as a threshold. We do have 10 units as a threshold for our inclusionary zoning. Right. So I guess my question to you, I'm trying to think of an example um, of something that's been approved long ago and is already built and um, has no issues. Uh, we had a church that was converted. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm like, I'll find one. Um, church that was converted into 13 units. That's over in West Glenwood. Um, it used to be a kayak store also on the bottom floor. You guys might be familiar with it. Um, so that was converted to 13 units. And when you look at that project, it still kind of looks like the church or a very large single family home mm -hmm. um, and has 13 units in it. Making a 13 unit project provide diversity in housing type I think might be on the end, if we're gonna get to me making a recommendation, that might be too small and getting into the cost prohibitive where those small infill projects, which we also encourage in our um, new comprehensive plan would be overly burdened. So I'm thinking if you want to make a threshold, I'm gonna throw out just my base number of what I think you should be over to start applying, let's say two housing types would be around the 40 unit mark. I wouldn't go below that. You can argue with me. This is a discussion. Yeah. And discuss. Well, I think that's a good point. And also, is there a sliding scale? If you know, if it's 40, then you need to have two, two types. And if it's 100, do you have to need right. to have so three? Similar or... to the sliding scale that we have now based on size, you could provide, if you're at 50 units, you need to provide two. And if you're at 100 units, you need to provide three or four. I was making sure we have four. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. You know, if you're at 200 units, you have to provide every variety type that exists. Mm -hmm. You could certainly make it so that it's scalable. Right. Well, I think that probably makes sense to do something like that mm -hmm. because, well, your point about the the 13 units is... You know, it would 
it would have been inappropriate to him and put that on that project. And I agree, it was worked out really well. They did a great job and provided 13 units of housing, boom, right there. Um, but, you know, how that scale falls. And, and really when you go back to that spreadsheet and look what we've taken in, there is really kind of a divide between small projects and the bigger projects. We don't have too many that come in in between, I would say 15 and 40. Um, most larger projects are gonna be above 40 units and the smaller projects don't really get above 15. So in thinking about a context, that might be a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this was called up by city council to start this. What's, what, is there an urgency to this? I believe there is an urgency just with, um, with affordability, obviously. Um, we've had a lot of conversations regarding making changes to code to increase um, those types of units. Um, and then also this has come about with the one project that I told you about where it was very clear that our code wasn't really working. Uh, so yes, this has been requested by city council. The intent is to get to a recommendation tonight. And I know that's, we could probably have three work sessions on this before we arrived at the perfect piece of code. Um, but there is a little bit more urgency to get this on the books um, so that we don't have any more of the small amount of our larger parcels go without having this. It's, it's kind of like a missed opportunity, which we feel a lot in code, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a hurry up and wait. And then we realize we need something and then it's let's do this now so that we don't miss out on the opportunity. So is uh, what sort of specificity should there be in this evening's discussion? And I think it would be great if you could um, get to the types of categories that you want included as the variety decide whether you want to keep it as a size, a parcel size, or go to a unit count, and then talk a little bit on if you're wanting to include the affordability components, let's get a general feeling of how aggressive you guys would like to recommend. Carolyn, please. Um, that's, that's great. Uh, I I do think that that church that we approved out there a few years ago um, is it is a solution to a you know a housing need. I think we might um, want to actually exempt building reuse because we're trying to incentivize people to not tear down buildings and put them in the landfill. So we might even want to introduce another way of exempting existing buildings that are being remodeled. Because how would you make it all townhouses? You know you you'd have to scrape the building, which isn't necessarily what the community has directed us to do. Um, but in terms of like starting this discussion, I think we should do away with the parcel size and move to a unit count to apply these, um, whatever regulations we decide on. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're basing percentages on unit counts, so kind of makes sense to and we're a to make it a unit. I, yeah, I agree. And we're yeah. we're nearly out of parcels of this size, so it's it's already sort of obsolete. We might as well revisit it now before there really are no large parcels remaining. And you know, a three acre parcel is fairly sizable. I think at that level, under three acres, we should be seeing different unit types. The large, I mean, the larger. Um, projects we've seen, you know, Bell Rippey and the canyons and what what are the parcel sizes on those? One moment. Professor's website. I need to get my spreadsheet, which is in this computer and not that one. Um, I believe Bell Rippey itself was just over four, if I can remember. Six Canyons was much smaller. I don't believe that reached the acre. But while we're talking, I'll pull up that spreadsheet so that I can reference it better and give you the exact. Um, another example of something that's been approved and is currently being built is uh, Mountain View Flats, which came through you guys and city council. 
That's a 40 unit building that's going up behind discount tire area. Um, their framing is almost completed. They are on just under an acre. So that's 40 units, roughly 40 units on an acre. They were not subject to the variety type either. But they do have a variety of unit sizes, I believe, as I recall, right? They have a variety of bedroom counts, yes. Bedroom count, yep. yeah. Talk amongst yourselves while I dive into the files here. So thinking about that on a, a 40 unit on an acre, you know, there seems to be a certain difficulty in creating different types on that size parcel, which would potentially reduce the number of units. Most certainly, yes. Um, so we're, um, things which is there sort of counterproductive. would be building height, which most of our zone districts only allow to go up to 40 feet. Um, so if you're providing townhouses and a multifamily apartment on one acre, it, it is going to get challenging. Which is sort of counterproductive to creating housing for the, to meet the housing need, yeah. right? Yeah. It'd be safe to assume that a single family or a duplex also has a ground level entrance similar to a townhouse. So basically the only units that could be not on ground level for rent are apartments because condos are for sale, right? Mm-hmm. So in this housing variety type though, a condo would meet that multifamily aspect. Good to know we're <laughs> You're confused, I'm confused. Um, so our current standards that have apartments and multifamily, it's not differentiated between rental and for sale. So we don't identify townhomes versus condominiums. It's just apartments and townhomes. We're talking about the structure of a home. But you're right, single family and duplex is going to be low. Um, you know, you could have a duplex that is two stories. Right, but is the duplex's entrance allowed to be on the top floor? <laughs> Probably doesn't say no. I don't know how you get into it. Well, you put apartments underneath. <laughs> Fascinating. I'm gonna need to go to the definition section. <laughs> <laughs> Entrances is something that we have a lot of code on. I'm like looking back at Watkins. So condominium is yeah, condominium is not one of the housing types on the list because it only differentiates how you obtain it. Right. It's not, not differentiating it between rent and for sale. And condominiums is a for sale product, meaning it's right. subdivided for individual ownership. That's the main distinction of condominiums. So you can have an apartment building that's condominiums and each apartment is owned by a single um, owner. Or townhouses similarly. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. So we only have one unit type that is basically not a ground level per what well, my assumed definition. Uh, yes. Yeah. Fair assessment. Maybe we need to make a new housing type. <laughs> you really want to do some work tonight. <laughs> um, so I have that spreadsheet up. So what were the um, types that you wanted to know? Acre parcels? Six, oh, eight. just uh, some of the larger, larger projects we've had. So which six canyons, which was formerly Oasis Creek Apartments over off of Highway 6. Um, that is 3.73 acres. Mm. Um, I believe they received a variance, so they did not have to meet this section of code. And there are how many units there? There are 116. So they have a density per acre of 31. And you said the Bell Rippey was um, what, 100 and, 102 or something? Uh, Bell Rippey is 100 units on five and a half acres. And we did make them provide two housing types. We did. Well, it apartments. was there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, was, <laughs> it was sort of laughable, actually. Yeah, it was. 
which is why we're here. Yeah. Then, then what's the unit of the nuance um, in the meadows that are just starting up meadows, now? Meadows, which is, uh, we refer to that as BLD. One moment, unless Watkins has it off the top of his head. Um, 300 units on 28 acres. And they weren't subject to that because they're in the Meadows Annexation Agreement documents. So it works a little differently. Subject to what? The, the Meadows Annexation documents. They, they have, the Meadows has its own zoning code basically written into the Annexation Agreement that was adopted in 2002, similar to the sign plan you just saw earlier. Which required what? They, uh, they that does densities, not densities assigned to specific tracts and types for sale and for rent, um, basically determined within those documents. And they were providing uh, an area for daycare and some other amenities, right? Uh, the BLD project um, at Meadows did get approved with a daycare facility component to it, yes. And that was it in terms of amenities beyond residential units. Uh, there's a clubhouse with a gym. Right. Okay. And a pool, I believe. So that factors into the 28 acres. I mean, with those. Sure. Yeah. But it, it, it's probably not the type. It's not the level of density that you would expect to see in this market otherwise. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's very dense. Well, there's some parameters. Um, John, please. I just want to circle back and comment that on that 40 unit, one acre example we were talking about, if that was subject to two housing types, that could be bedroom count and multifamily, these two types, right? You don't have to have two different structures. Like you don't have to have multifamily and townhouse. You could use bedroom count as one of your types. Yes, as being proposed with yeah. staff, right? Mm -hmm. um, with current code they weren't subject to it so mm -hmm. but yes <clears throat> i know this is a lot to digest and make a recommendation on so please do let me know how i can help guide you um, if we want to tackle it by topic i know carolyn just threw out let's consider changing it to a unit we could take the temperature of how you feel on that one and then move on to one of many others. Oh, if we want to get out of here by midnight, you know, just right. to <laughs> <laughs> I, I might be able to do that. Is that a there good you go. idea? Everybody's on. Okay. Whoops. I got to scroll down somehow there. Okay. I agree with going with the unit count instead of the size of the acre and the size of the property. I think that's the yep. smart way to go. Yeah. Who else? I concur. Okay. Yeah. It's done. All right. It sounds like we're in, looks like a majority of agreement um, to change the threshold to a unit count base. Yes. I like Hannah's threshold of 40. Agreed. Agreed. And so with 40 units, are we looking at two types? The threat, the threat of midnight, really. <laughs> <laughs> good, good job. <laughs> Would it include affordability or do we still have to get to that point? We're going to make that a, a type. A type. I guess that's a good question. Maybe we can mix the two. So I've got, yeah. we're going to change to a unit count base. There's an idea of 40 as a threshold. We can further talk about that. How is the temperature of adding affordability components to the unit types? How are we going to define affordability again? Um, there's a variety of ways we can do that, but some of the suggestions um, are a certain percentage of AMI, area median income. So let's take an example of 80% um, of the units are 100% AMI or below. Price to 100% AMI or below. 
or you can lower that. I know we're dealing with a lot of percentages mm. or a hundred percent of the units are resident occupied. That's a little less on the affordability side, but it speaks to housing the people that work in Glenwood, um, which has been a large topic of conversation. Um, Richard, you you had thrown out. So I, I, I actually think we might want to have require two, two or three of the affordability strategies. So I would say like 100% residency occupied is kind of a no brainer because we don't need more short term rentals. Uh, right. Or absentee homeowners. Or, right. Yeah, second homes would also yeah. fall into that. Um, and then I think you you have the community inclusionary housing level up pretty high, over 70%, maybe 80%. Um, I mean, I think we are seeing some of these developers come in sniffing around, looking at numbers like that, up to 100%. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that would be, you know, basically a deed restriction with the city that um, caps rents or caps the resale price. Um, and then I think another option that Carl suggested that would be kind of a relief valve from this is if they don't want to do one of those, then they would pay basically a mitigation fee um, that would be priced commensurately. It would be expensive. Um, that would go to the city to be able to buy deed restrictions mm. um, within the project. So to give you context on that, that's what we would refer to as a fee in lieu. So you meet this requirement. If you don't want to meet this requirement, then you are subject to, say, 20% of the free market value of your project goes into an affordable housing fund or whatever fund. Mm. If we're talking about affordability, then affordable affordable housing fund which um, now could be combined you know possibly with our 2c funding component that we have now for a greater benefit before our inclusionary zoning um, requirement did have a fee in lieu component to it that didn't work very well because it didn't actually require that much of a fee and so developers chose that as a mechanism and then the city had very little funds to then actually do something about affordable housing so again, with the aggressive component, if we're looking at fee and lieu, you probably want to make it so that it's, you know, act, you can actually do something with that funds to address the issue that it's intended to solve. So if some developer wanted to create luxury housing and he's never going to do the affordability thing, but, but wouldn't he just pick the other housing types then as opposed to paying to not use the affordability housing type? Like, why would we have it if you can pay your way out of it? Because he can he then count it as he's using it, even though he's paying a fee in lieu. Yes, it would. <laughs> it would. It would allow a more luxury product to be delivered, and if if the, if it worked out for the developer, they could pay the fee, and the city would go right back in and buy units down at the city's option. You know, at the city's option, they can choose which units buy those units down to an affordable level at the right. restriction. By using the affordability housing type. My good friend Watkins just brought up a point that if that were the case and they're buying their way out of the housing variety, inclusionary zoning is still going to apply. Yes, good, yeah. So luxury townhomes with maybe one or two in there, depending on how large the project is, that will be an affordable product. Mm -hmm. Okay. So buying their way out of this section of code, not the whole code. And am I understanding it correctly that when you get to a certain percentage of inclusionary housing, the, the tax credits available to the developer at that point become kind of a sweetener for developing affordable housing? And, and they're, they're pegged to a lower, much lower AMI if we're talking about LIHTC. Um, I don't know about... Yeah, so low that, that's the, I mean, that's the one that we see a lot more. Yeah, okay. they're very competitive to get. Um, and so it's an application process through DOLA every year, CHAPA, excuse me, every year. And so the, the benefit there is they're actually going much lower than any of our code could ever, in theory, require. So we're getting at 40% um, AMI, 50% AMI, 60%. They usually don't go above 80 
all of our requirements currently in the city are pegged at 100% AMI, and that's why we refer, we refer to it as workforce housing. It's obtainable, but not it wouldn't meet an affordable, affordable product um, that you don't get um, from the free market community because it takes such a heavy subsidy. Thinking about the fee in lieu, you were saying 20% of the, the project cost, potentially. You know, I'm, I'm, what I'm getting at, I was wondering if it makes sense to make that fee in lieu targeted to the providing the, or allowing the city to, to provide a, an affordable unit at the current you know, cost of construction or development or whatever. You know what I'm trying to say is, uh, and that would allow the developer, if he wanted to do a luxury thing, to build the luxury park product and still provide funds to the city to build or provide housing for somebody else. I mean, where else? You know, I mean, it, it allows him to to still potentially maximize his product with this with this luxury thing without it being tied directly to the cost of building a luxury unit. Right. Yeah. And it, I mean, it wouldn't. It doesn't necessarily have to go right back into that project. Um, yeah. But so you're saying do it on a case by case basis? Yeah. And I don't, I'm not clear on, on the details of this. No, I, I mean, I think because we are expediting this, I think if you, if you are comfortable saying, yeah, let's pursue these affordability options, then right. we're happy to take that back and work on it in the next week. Um, with the recommendation to, to council for what we think the commission a fee and lieu component yeah and as as part of the affordability menu yeah I'm, I'm happy with it sure so we think for affordability we're doing thumbs up generally Re like 100 percent residency occupied I'd say 80% AMI. I think we've got a lot of 100% AMIs in, in the charts that Hannah's been bringing us. There is, um, there's a major shortage of lower income housing. And should we, you know. You can certainly look at, you know, we're saying aggressive, if you want yeah. to go that way. You could be aggressive on the percentage of units that have to be whatever, affordable. Or you could be more aggressive on, let's say, 30% of the units have to be 80% AMI. You know, as you're getting in those lower AMI categories, that has real economic impacts for a project. So you'd want to kind of flex on either side, right? It's a teeter totter. Mm -hmm. Which which do you want to be more aggressive on? If you want to be more aggressive to get the most affordable units, then you want to bring that AMI level down. If you want to get more workforce units, then that's what 100% AMI or 90. You could throw out 90% AMI as well. Um, and if you want to see what those AMI looks like, I can look like I can bring it up certainly. Um, but you could give us a direction, just as Richard mentioned, of like we like the idea of more affordable, so a lower AMI, um, or we like the idea of more units, possibly at a higher AMI. And we could even have a sliding, put a sliding scale within that. Like if you're going to do a lower AMI. Right. How would... <laughs> if you do a super low AMI, you don't have to provide so many units. Maybe. If it's a right. hundred, you gotta have more units. Yeah, because like at some point if we if we go really low on the AMI, there, you know, there's gonna be a, a higher a, a cap on the percentage of units that they can do with that. Right. And so you do see a lot of projects where it's like you need this number of this level of AMI, this number at this level of AMI, maybe like three categories within mm -hmm. the project. Is that yeah? I was going to say is there the potential for a, you know, tying it to multiple income requirements and averaging or weighting it. Um, yeah, I think are you guys comfortable with that yeah. idea? And we can kind of people like choices, right? Yeah, it would, and it will <laughs> and it will result in more diversity within yeah. the project. Yeah, I'd say nothing over one hundred though. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not affordable, really. Sliding scale topping out at 100%. I think we're going to have three sliding scales nested within. Yeah. <laughs> 60, 80, and 100. It's going to be the most confusing piece of code I've ever read. Oh, yeah. I want to watch this council meeting. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, that, that sounds good because it's kind of a question I had was, or a concern or a thought I had was, um, and you certainly want to have too much discretion in this kind of thing because people need some certainty and discretion can, things get muddy that way. But I think just kind of what this conversation we just had creates that opportunity to have a responsive, such a code um, to respond to where those needs are um, by kind of doing more of a, a kind of a free market exercise and and choosing that so yeah i think it's it gives the applicants the ability to figure out what actually works for them yeah there's not a lot of carrot to this but at least to give them flexibility so right. yeah, we have an affordability housing type what about the bedroom count <laughs> For for unit counts, are we still do we want a scale on that? I don't think we did address the scale if we're doing 40 and then 80 and then something right. more. Do we really need to even count one bedrooms? Because I think that's probably the majority of the stock out there from the applications we've seen. I mean, I think what Richard is talking about is actually the threshold of units. Two times. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you're gonna do did we decide on there's a 40. 40, yeah. And then to go to if, two types at that point. Right? Yeah. And then if you do 80, are we going to do three types? And I then think so. over sure. 120, yeah, I think so. or I, I don't know. Well, and with affordability as a proposed type, you can still have a single multifamily building that fills three types relatively mm -hmm. easily. Yeah. Easily might not be the right word, but <laughs> practically. Which, in theory, then I guess we could lessen the unit count to get to those types if we wanted to be aggressive with a particular type right because if we were counting um yeah because bedroom count could be a type affordability could be a type and then and we'll certainly look at the bedroom count aspect because in in creating this suite of options what we don't want to create is like a low like super low hanging fruit where they where an 80 unit project comes in and they can provide something that doesn't really meet your intent. So we'll take a, a second look at that three bedroom option. Cause really when staff was throwing that out, we weren't quite yet thinking about the affordability aspect. So um, that's something that might get removed from a staff recommendation and replaced with an affordability component. Cause the three bedroom, three bedroom types was really getting at Kind of the flexibility for the developer, which we're already getting in projects. So it was a little bit more on the gimme side, give you side, however you want to say that. But the affordability side, the affordability component would be better getting at the community benefit within a single architectural type. Do we know by bedroom count where we're short or just by AMI where we're short of housing types in the community? Like, are we short of four bedrooms? You know, I'm assuming we've got lots of one bedrooms because that's what I see advertised and that's what I've seen us approve. But some people have larger extended families. I mean, maybe they're having a harder time finding a place to live. We haven't seen any four bedroom of anything. Have yeah, we? four bedrooms. What's that? Well, um, you get a grandma moved in, and then you sure. get the teenager. I think, you know, that's that's something that we don't see very often. Four bedroom, at least not in this community, because there aren't any. Well, it's, that's a very large home. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say there aren't any, but we haven't seen that being built. It's a house. Really. It yeah. is that is really that comes more in the single family house category. Mm -hmm. You see that, but those could be rentals. Those houses, yeah. certainly. Um, I'm looking at our spreadsheet. We do like have places like that where they have big condos or mm -hmm. townhouses that they rent out. Yeah. So, but I don't think of you have a have big that. family and you need to rent and don't want to buy, you just don't live here. <laughs> Go <steam up>. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna strike that last comment. <laughs> <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> um, you know, I think there is a perception. Um, in the community that we have a lot of like one bedroom and studios and that's all that's being built. That's not what my spreadsheet shows. Mm -hmm. We do have quite a variety in the one studio to two bedroom where it starts to drop off as far as unit types that are coming in is those three bedrooms. That's where we're talking about 
um, you know, there's three units that are three bedrooms in a 30 unit complex. So there's not that many, but there's a couple sprinkled in there. But really where the market is focusing right now is studio to two bedroom. What we've built though, not by demand, not what is needed, but what we've approved. What has gone through the process and gotten approved? Okay, sure. I'm sure a developer would say that they do their research and that what that's what the demand is, but I'm not a developer, so. Right. Well, is bedroom count too confusing? Do we need it? You could leave it up to your wonderful staff to figure out. Good. I feel like that's an area that um, I think a developer is going to be, you know, pretty responsive to whatever the needs of the community are. They're not going to build something that people are going to be able to live in, or that that demand will be there. Um, so I'm I'm comfortable having that conversation exist between planning department and the any developer. I'm okay with. We could we could keep it as a, keep it in as an option that we discuss with city council for consideration. If you're not comfortable pulling it out. We can keep it in from your recommendation tonight. Richard has something to add. Yeah, I would suggest that. And I think maybe we could do more research on it and see if there is some market. Uh, I know I know that at least one development that did do a pretty thorough market survey, and we might be able to call them to ask mm -hmm. if they have that information. Uh, yeah, I, mean, my, I, I know a lot of families that have two kids. But not, are those kids going to, you know, share a bedroom when they're growing up? But yeah, I'm okay with leaving that. I did, Carolyn. I did. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you can tell I'm an only child, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. I, I, I think there's, I, 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 on legal opinion, but I, I think there is value in having that diversity in there um, for the reasons that you've cited. But, we don't need to necessarily be prescriptive of what those bedroom types ought to be, right? Just generally that they need to consider different bedroom types, not any specific bedroom type, correct? Provide a variety. Yeah. Okay. Right? Yeah. And I mean, maybe as based on percentages. Or... Sorry, I was just going to say, what, like Hannah was saying, that affordability sort of addresses part of that diversity that we were, that the intent was, maybe that bedroom count isn't uh, available to the, the lower threshold developments, mm -hmm. the lower unit count developments that would encourage the affordability route versus the bedroom count route. Mm -hmm. Maybe a different set of types for the lower threshold than the higher threshold. That's an interesting I, I think that might start getting really complicated drafting Thanks. <laughs> exercise <laughs> yeah I, I i don't know if we i mean if, if we could do it it's just gonna start getting harder to explain um what do you think i um yeah you don't want a super large onion <laughs> manageable onion with like eight layers <laughs> well it seems like if we have a fee and lieu that's like the get out of jail card in whatever category they could be right so if there's something that they don't want to subscribe to you they can plug in the they can essentially pay for that pipe not being there right is that mitigation factor the, yeah the fee and lieu would remove them from providing the, the different categories if we include that. So what other considerations from your guidance? I think we have covered um, the thresholds um, with the types and some affordability. Uh, I guess the last question on a recommendation, what do you guys think about applying this to mixed use developments as well? as residential. And they might look a little different, right? So that might be a category where we where we add the layer because uh, mixed use doesn't have any right now and residential has the category. So they're different as they stand, um, but we could 
provide a recommendation that council look at applying some of the categories in a mixed use project. And the reason why they're different, and I included this in the staff report, uh, you know, um, providing variety of type, when you have a mixed use project, there's already kind of a variety of what's going on there, right? So you have commercial uses and residential as well. So there's a little, there's variety in architecture, there's a variety of uses. And I believe that's why this hasn't been a component that's existed. Um, but when we are looking at possibly a larger mixed use project that's coming in at the 100 unit or 80 unit, as we've discussed, there might, you know, that might warrant looking at these affordability measures. So I guess there, I would want to see a recommendation from you guys. Should that be explored as an option to include in our mixed use projects as well? I have a question about mixed use. Say I've got a two acre parcel and I want to really build housing. Can I just put like a convenience store in the corner and then boom, it's mixed use? Um, is there, does it have to be like 50-50 housing plus commercial? No, so our mixed use zoning is really just stating you can do both because our housing uh, zoning districts don't allow for much commercial, right? right? It limits it. So, so somebody it, could sneak through the back door, build a giant housing unit with none of these uh, tempering devices just by putting in a rinky-dink little, you know, comic store or something that's superfluous. Well, I wouldn't call it sneaking through because they have an entire section of code that they have to abide by as well with actually more, I would say, cumbersome or expanded design requirements for a mixed use project that residential doesn't have. So I, I don't think it would, I don't think that would be the case. Yeah. Okay. Mixed use though is, is in terms of like, think about the comprehensive plan is going to do a lot of things that we would want. It's going to provide housing on a second or a third floor and retail on the first floor. Lots of alternatives for people. I believe it should, like what you're suggesting that we should apply those. Right, but then we have preempted ourselves from townhouses, single family and duplexes because they have to be on the ground floor. I wouldn't say you've preempted. Um, you could have a front facing apartment complex that on the backside has townhomes that go the entire height of that building. Okay. And then you've got two. It would all be attached mm -hmm. in the same building, but you provided two types right there. Okay, good point. Uh, the other thing is with most mixed use development, the, the mixed part is almost a type in its in itself, right? The commercial aspect. Mm -hmm. So you think of at a 80, the threshold of 80, we talked about three types, then you would only need two other I, than the I commercial. Think that makes sense. At, at 40, so that, you would need one, and at 80, you would need two. So if. Hmm. Okay. Because you're accounting for commercial as, as a type. Being a type. type. Being a variety of use and architectural on the site already. I'll buy that. Am I seeing some? It is, it is something that is not as economically attractive as residential and. It's something that I think the comp plan wants to incentivize. I think that's what Commissioner Hodden is proposing. Well, I think there's, in my mind, there's no question that if you have a mixed use with that many residents in it, that it these standards at some level should apply. Sure. General census. Yes. I'm good there. with the 40 with one and the 80 with two <clears throat> housing types or unit types. Or allowing the commercial being a type. Yeah, yeah. If you wanna call commercial a type where uh, in the zone districts it's allowed then it matches with the non-resident or with the residential zone district. So it's okay. it'll be two, three and four, but commercial is one of the- I think I'm getting the general feeling on that yeah. one. Yeah. We'll figure it out. It's a little bit to different to it, account yeah. for that um, mixed use that we do want to encourage in the city. Uh, so I guess kind of related to that, but going back to the uh, live work, is there a is there a demand for live work scenarios, situations where in a, in our community for that type of structure? And I just think about that as far as like a mixed use potential, and there's an opportunity for us. Then do we need to open up, essentially qualifying? areas to plug live work options into developments, if that would make sense in that context. 
it could be a housing type that we would add and then of course have to add more zone districts where it's allowed well so live work units are allowed uh, what we viewed before from uh, residential transitional up um, speaking to demand, I don't know about demand. I can tell you what we've received as far as projects that include that and not very many. Mm -hmm. And from a business owner, I guess I would ask you, you know, is there, is there a benefit to you in running a business that you include a residential component there for an employee or something of that nature? It was really a live work unit is, is mm -hmm. aimed at providing a more flexibility for the commercial side to also include the residential component, just like our residential zone districts limit commercial some of our commercial zones limited residential opportunities and how they how it could look okay so i guess i guess something i would i would suggest then is in that is that we we look at kind of freeing up any restrictions or limitations not any but um common sense application of live work scenarios and i'm just i guess i'm just kind of talking about you know my other gig the other hat i wear and um you know having a bunkhouse on top of my my boathouse would be awesome. Um, you can do uh, it. And have yeah, an employee out there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there's a new tattoo artist and there's no place to rent. So if you had a shop that had a little unit in the back, you could actually hire someone to, to work there. Yeah. And I, I yeah, it, perhaps, you know, as we talked about, just kind of brainstorming uh, in that conversation the other week is opportunities for um for area businesses to partner up together and actually do a joint development that again kind of has that ground floor commercial aspect with some residential up top and then maybe there's some um some rental units that aren't attached to those businesses also up there you know kind of, i guess kind of like what we saw with c dot and the caverns over there maybe right and that's those aren't live work units just for mm -hmm. category's sake right that's a mixed use development because the um residential aspect is not tied to the office employment component down below. Whereas a live work unit from our code is the owner, you live there and work there, or your employee, someone who is working at the right. commercial component is living in the back. Caverns Village, um, while it was built by an employer, it's not a stipulation there. So they those can be any residential tenants. Okay. I feel like a, a lot of cities in the olden days were almost all live work. You know, you lived upstairs and the shop was downstairs and that's, you know, it seems sort of odd that we've gotten away from that and now have to like reintroduce it as a new thing where it is so traditional. Uh, and I, I think we should encourage more of that, even though we haven't seen it much. Maybe that's why folks haven't thought to to bring it before, um, at, you know, as an application. But I, I really like the idea. Yeah. Too. Practically, what what does that the enforcement of that look like? Is it a deed restriction? Is it um, right? How do you guarantee? <laughs> I think it would just be a deed restriction. We have processed one of these, and let's talk later. <laughs> um, that is maybe something that we need to look at. Interesting question. Thank you for that. I mean, it would it would still be part of the condition of approval. Um, but yeah, we do we'll, have an enforcement mechanism that's built into code. I wouldn't say we wrote it as a deed restriction per se. I'd need to go back because we haven't had very many of these. Uh, but there's certainly a component that they were approved as a certain type, and so there's um, compliance mechanisms that we have within the city if any type of development is no longer meeting what they were approved under. Um, I'm just thinking it's potentially a, a riskier investment for a business owner. My widget store goes under. I have to find a very specific person or company to sell this to mm. that also wants a live work unit. It's a little bit more specific. And I, 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 I don't want to give the impression that I don't think this is a worthy topic to talk about, but I don't think it's as important for um, our housing variety discussion. Um, but I think it warrants staff taking a further look at that. Um, I do believe that we are allowing it in the city pretty encouraging as far as the zoning that it has. So you can do live work units right now. Um, and, you know, I put that topic in that proposal for you as, as a new type that we could consider, but I'm not sure that this is the appropriate place for it to be included for housing variety. 
because it is it is pretty widely accepted and maybe the the projects will start rolling in so you're, you're <laughs> saying to exclude that as a, as a I, housing? I am saying it might not be the most appropriate um, housing variety type to include here in a mixed use development oh in mixed use well there's not right it's what you want to see because it the type itself, oh, when transition. you look at that, of how it how it walks and talks, it's probably not as enticing to a business as we as we might think here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna table that topic. I will look into it further in between now and city council so that I'm better informed on how that actually looks and works mm. and make a recommendation if we need to include it as a type. So we should address what all the different types are. To, this, to as we see them to council. I think we already- um, Have we done that? Yeah, we kind of discussed, you know, unless there's a type that's listed in the current code or proposal that you absolutely think should be kicked out. We talked about these types that are there and then the affordability component, which would be adding some new types. Okay, what else? Public comment. Those poor three panelists. If okay, so um, I do see the I'll comment. open the the discussion to the public. Um, there is one attendee, and uh, not on online. And if that person would care to comment, uh, I'll pause for the forty-five seconds to wait <laughs> for that whole process to happen. And anyone online that would like to speak, um, Doug Pratt, if you want, <laughs> now would be your time to add any comment to this, if you so choose. We do have a hand raised. Ah, so please. Mute Doug. Go ahead, Doug. Hi, this is Doug Pratt. Um, thanks uh, for hosting this. One second. We oh, need to ahead. adjust the volume. Can you try that again? Hi, can you? This is Doug Pratt. Not quite. It's not coming through these yeah. speakers. How about now? No, no. still not. Not yet, Doug. Give us one second. Oh, now he's gone. He's muted again. I've, oh, there I've uh, promoted myself to a panelist. <laughs> can you can you hear me now? Not yet, Doug. You can't do okay. it we're we're working on it. Okay. Pat is one of our local land use planners, private planner. We used to field trip. <laughs> hmm. 
speakers up that we can show a speaker then this could be what we can turn on. Oh yeah. Here's something. Use the <laughs> Done it before. Yep. I think I've got this left. Well, that there. used to be the whole workaround for like a year. Just call on the phone. We just have the speaker phone sitting right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Doug, if you can hear me, this is Hannah Klausman. I believe you have my cell phone number. If you could call that now, <laughs> I will put you on speaker phone. Okay. <laughs> hey, Doug, I'm going to put you on speaker up to the mic, and hopefully this will work. Great, thanks. Okay, go ahead. Hi, this is Doug Pratt. I'm a, a private sector planner in the Roaring Fork Valley doing work in the city of Glenwood Springs. Can you hear me okay? Is that... Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, thanks. Um, I hadn't really been planning on speaking, so thanks so much for the efforts. Um, uh, but I did want to say uh, that I really do support uh, some of your discussion tonight, especially related to the opportunity, if you're looking for diversity of unit types, to include you know things like bedroom counts and and uh I, i'm a little bit unclear and you don't have to explain it to me um right now uh, just about how some of the affordability aspects of the discussion that you've had tonight vary from uh, your inclusionary housing so again um I'll, I'll keep following you don't need to answer that but i i would like to just become more clear on how the two aspects, inclusionary housing and affordability in a variety of unit types um, uh, um, relate to each other. But that being said, I do think um, you have strong architectural standards in your code that deal with building types and not having buildings that are supposed to look exactly like one another. So I feel a little bit like having architectural types as diversity is not as strong in my opinion for the city of Glenwood Springs as having unit types, bedroom types, affordability types, much like you've just discussed tonight. So that's a little impromptu on my part. I hope that makes sense. Um, so again, just kind of supporting more of a look at the units versus architecture, meaning townhome versus duplex versus apartment versus um, single family home. I mean, those diversity of housing types are all great, but it really is um, some diversity and in, in bedroom counts and affordability that I think would be helpful to the code. And that's it. Great. Thank thanks, you. Uh, I'm hang up now. Okay, thanks. Bye. Hooray, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is an action item, right? Or was that a recommendation? Do we need to you could we need to address this? Vote to um, recommend to city council as discussed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then I took it down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good with that. Okay. Do we have a motion? Oh, here you turned yours off. Carolyn. Oh, I move to uh, recommend to council the um, modifications to our uh, housing types uh, as discussed. I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion from Carolyn Zipperly and a second from um, Matthew Sims. Any more discussion on this topic? Seeing none, I'll call a question. Motion passed unanimously. Uh, Great. Thank you so much for doing that work. Thank you. You're doing all the work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, commissioner comments. Um, I'll start with John. Yeah. April. None for me. 
None for me. Okay. Carolyn. I'll, I'll invite y'all to come to the ribbon cutting at the Cardiff Coke ovens tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock on Airport Road. That's my pet project with the um, Historical Society. So it's an open invitation. I hope to see lots of folks from the city and the county there as well. Gregory. Thank you. Um, was our last, is our last meeting available on YouTube or someplace? It should be, yes. Okay. Um, John missed out. He was the only one that uh, we had a, a nice discussion about uh, from Richard about the legal aspects of things. And I don't know if you've watched that, but I would encourage you to. It's, um, you know, it's, it's really good guidance for what we can do and what we shouldn't be doing and all of that. So uh, just, just that comment, but that's all I have. And Carl and I will reach out to individually meet with Commissioner Houghton the way we have with everybody. Everybody else has had a meeting with us, correct? I believe so, yeah. yeah. It was so, very useful. Yeah. So we, we will set to get that set up. And yes, George, we think the same because now that I recall, I sent an email to John with the link to that meeting recommending that he. Oh, okay. So. Well, we're on the same page. <laughs> um, director's comments. Um, yes, I think you guys all saw in an email that we do have very important applications coming up for our June meeting. So do put that on your calendar and let me know if you are not going to be here. Oh, Carolyn. Okay. Um, so uh, <laughs> one of those is going most likely, obviously this can always change, right? And I try and let you know what's coming and what's not. Our strategic housing plan update is from our consultants will likely be coming in our June meeting. So you'll get to take a look at some new information on housing needs that they have done and also recommendations for further code changes. So um, look forward to more hefty conversations from me and the team on other housing policy updates that we can make in our code. Um, and we also have a residential project um, for Habitat for Humanity that will also be on the June agenda. Okay, great. Well, I'd say this meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm.